Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 281, The Danger of the Ninth. Mining Uriu is an 18-year-old woman with purple hair that matches the color of her eyes. Mining is the name of one of the participants in this survival game, more precisely the ninth, who attacked Yuno from behind. This woman is resilient and unpredictable, making it challenging to kill her. Yuki knew this, and so did Yuno. Her childhood was marked by the destruction of her village in a war that turned it into a battlefield. Her family perished in the crossfire, leaving her to survive alone without anyone's help. Due to her traumatic experiences, Minin had to resort to being a terrorist and doing dirty work. Despite this, she considers herself a survivor above all, as reflected in her escape diary. Her diary is unique and powerful, guiding her on the path to escape in various situations, detailing where to go, hide, and for how long. This ability activates only if she has a chance to avoid defeat or specific conditions are met. Given her status as a nuclear bomb that has killed another participant, few dare to threaten her. Apart from her diary, Minin is experienced in escaping, having eluded the police and private agents multiple times before obtaining the future diary. She even successfully escaped from the serial killer third, showcasing her natural survival instincts. Considering herself the most important, she trusts no one and believes she doesn't need anyone. Threatening people allied with her is futile, as she operates solo. Mining is tactical, intelligent, astute, and can easily deduce and acquire information. Combined with her powers, Yuki knows that even if he wins, she will escape at the slightest hint of danger, given her control over time and space, making her survival chances higher than his. Acknowledging her formidable nature, Yuki and Yuno decide to let her be, recognizing that facing her now would only drain their energy and time, resources they can't afford to waste. They devise a plan to reduce the number of participants, hinder the ninth from gaining more power, and ultimately focus on surviving the 72-hour time limit without directly confronting her. Despite their strategy, they remain vigilant, knowing Minin's cunning nature might lead to another attack. Now, let's find shelter. I need to rest. Yes, Yuki. With the city destroyed, Yuki and Yuno move to a new location. Yuki needs to replenish his chakra, and this place, while not ideal, offers some respite. They are aware that the world's inhabitants will soon investigate the cause of this tragic incident. Frustrated by the potential interference of common humans, Yuki wishes to avoid getting involved, drawing from his experience in the Guilty Crown world. Dash. As everyone can see, an unknown phenomenon has occurred, visible worldwide. Experts from various countries claim it's the first time such an event has taken place. We don't know its meaning or if it poses a threat, but due to its uniqueness and form, NASA named it the Gaia Crown. Experts continue to investigate this phenomenon, we await their prompt response. In other news, the center of Sekarami City has been devastated in what appears to be a nuclear catastrophe. The cause remains unknown, leaving thousands missing and hundreds dead. Survivors claim a giant monster ravaged the city, while others suspect a massive terrorist attack. The military has mobilized to aid survivors and uncover the truth. It has begun. While many remain unaware, participants of the survival game understand precisely what's happening. This includes Tsubaki Kajigano, a beautiful girl with vision problems, the sixth participant with the clairvoyance diary. Thanks to her diary, she is fully aware of the ongoing events, able to see what people within her territory see and control them at will. Despite her powerful abilities, she is not invincible, with limitations such as relying on her vitality for her space attribute and being unable to control other participants. For now, I'll wait. The second will deal with future threats. Closing her eyes slightly, Tsubaki caressed her diary, sighing softly. She believed her temple, located outside the city, would remain undisturbed by the chaos among participants. She couldn't be more wrong. Her diary entries started to change. She e e. Hmm. Opening her eyes curiously, Tsubaki read the new entries. April 11, 10.35 a.m. An intruder has infiltrated. The temple explodes, many died. Ninth has discovered me. Dead end. In shock, Tsubaki couldn't help but drop her diary. She thought the temple was secure, shielded from the actions of other participants. However, she was mistaken. 
while she cared little for the people in her religion, she realized that her own life was at stake. What can I do how can I survive? Escaping seemed futile, she could only hide. Yet, when her hiding place was revealed, there was nothing she could do. Tsubaki knew this well, remembering how the eleventh was killed when his hiding spot was uncovered. Holding her head in despair, she, like everyone else, desired to win the survival game and live. But now? No. Maybe, there's a way out. As if recalling something, her eyes lit up. She knew she couldn't defeat the ninth with her current strength, but that didn't mean others couldn't. After all, ninth feared a particular participant a participant who had already killed two of them. I need to make them protect me. Her only chance was to have that person protect her, otherwise, she would perish. Chapter 282, How to Tame Your Yandera Bang! Bang! Damn it! How dare you cling to Yuki like that where did you come from thieving cat? You deserve to die. I am the master's sword, it's normal for me to be by his side. You're a damn whore. Yuki is mine. Bang, bang. How did this happen? Putting a hand to his head, Yuki sighed. In these moments, Yuno was furious, knocking over furniture with her katana while chasing Est, who was naked, attempting to cut her. Yuki, on the other hand, had a headache watching this unfold. Est played a cat and mouse game, being a spirit sword, regular katanas couldn't harm her, not even a magical one. Her strength, combined with Yuki, gave them a significant advantage. Don't run. I can't cut you that way. Swish. Swish. Waving her katana back and forth, Yuno had a terrifying expression, while Est leaped and dodged each of her attacks. Yuki found it a headache, as Est teased her like Mana used to, with Yuno chasing her with a massive sword. As for Yuki, seeing Est's legs and beautiful silver hair was amusing, but he was content with her lowly shaped body. Now, let's rewind a bit to find out how they ended up in this situation. Dash. After deciding to leave Novena in peace, they moved to another city. Initially, they considered living in the mountains due to the abundant chakra, but the nomadic lifestyle posed challenges. Living in the modern world with its conveniences was more appealing, so they settled in an abandoned hotel owned by Yuno's wealthy deceased parents. Despite being bankrupt, these hotels served as the perfect hideout with all facilities still operational. After finding a room, Yuno insisted on sleeping with Yuki, making nighttime surveillance easier. However, the trouble arose the next morning. Yuno woke up, hugging one of Yuki's arms, only to find Est, naked, hugging the other. Unsurprisingly, Yuno nearly exploded. She didn't know where Est came from, but having another woman cling to her beloved's arm in her presence drove her mad. Thus, the scene unfolded. For Yuki, finding Est clinging to his arm every morning was natural. In the realm of gods, sleeping with Kurumi meant waking up with her on one arm and Est on the other. The same went for Inorai, even when Hestia, drunk, pulled him to bed, Est appeared the next day. He always slept with one woman and woke up with two. So, it didn't surprise him. Grrrrrr. Growling and furrowing her brow even more, Yuno's hands glowed as she neared her breaking point, ready to use her spatial ability while Est prepared to transform. Stop both of you now. Yet, Yuki intervened faster, halting their small fight. Yuki. With white arms holding her, Yuno opened her eyes in disbelief, looking at Yuki in confusion. Yuno, Est is my contracted spirit, my fighting partner. She's my sword. It's natural for her to be with me. Yuki. How could you? Hearing Yuki's words, Est's cheeks reddened in embarrassment. They were in this together, as for Yuno, those words felt like the end of the world, Yuki was choosing another woman over her. Don't misunderstand, you know. As I said, Est is my sword, and part of my power. There's nothing that can be done. Seeing tears fall from Yuno's eyes, Yuki shook his head, this girl was too emotional. Est. Does materializing mean the Sephira crystal stabilized? Yes, master. The Sephira crystal stabilized, and we can continue our activities as normal, as long as we don't deplete all our energy. Since falling victim to the chat room, 
S stayed in Yuki's spiritual world to stabilize and avoid being consumed by the Demon King. She didn't even emerge when they fought 11th and 12th. But now, everything seemed fine, at least regarding their power. While Yuno was at the limit of her patience, clenching her fists and teeth, seeing them flirt so intimately made her inner power surge. Of course, Yuki knew how Yuno felt. With his experience with Mana and his past life's woman, he knew this dependency required utmost patience and understanding, otherwise, these women would become uncontrollable killers. Yuki couldn't allow Yuno to continue, otherwise, her future would be a disaster. He walked slowly toward where Yuno was bound and gave her a quick kiss on the lips. The white arms returned to the shadows, releasing her. Yuki. With her mind blank, Yuno looked at Yuki's face, caught off guard by the kiss. Calm down. I'll be with you, so don't worry. No matter what happens, I won't abandon you. Trust me. How to tame a Yandere it's straightforward give her what she wants. Many of these women suffer from loneliness and lack of love during their upbringing. Always alone, without anyone to love and comfort them in their toughest times. So, when they fall in love, they give themselves completely, losing themselves in madness and fear. Fear of losing the only person who loves them in the world. That's the root of their jealousy. They'll always fear that their most precious person will leave them one day, making any woman approaching their boyfriends the biggest source of their hatred. He's the only person I want in the world. There are thousands of men out there. How dare you take him from me? You have parents, a family that loves you, the whole world loves you, and yet you go after my boyfriend. Don't you dare take him away, or I'll kill you. I only need him and only him. Nothing else matters, so stay away from him. In their madness, they'll eliminate any potential threat daring to jeopardize their happiness. To cure this illness. The boyfriend or victim needs a lot of patience, as one wrong step could end their life. They need to make her understand that no one can separate them, that her jealousy is unfounded, and she is special in their life. Of course, this only works if you truly love that person. And if you don't love them, well. You don't want to know. Yuki. I love you. I love you. I love you. As Yuki thought, his action worked. Yuno dropped her katana, embracing him tightly, completely forgetting about Est as if she didn't exist in the first place. I need to take it step by step. This requires a lot of time, as Yuki has to gradually force Yuno to get used to having other women around, or everything will end with Est being the first. Yuki has already pulled strings behind the scenes to introduce the real guinea pig and, if lucky, turn her into an intimate friend of Yuno. Chapter 283, Guest How Persistent Yuno's love is heavy and toxic. Yuki could feel it, after all, Yuno clung to him, ignoring Est, completely immersed in her own world. Master. And, of course, Est didn't lag behind, she clung to Yuki's free arm. But before she could get closer, Yuno's katana gleamed, preventing Est from approaching. Don't you dare. Her eyes dimmed, and her face was expressionless. They engaged in a silent staring contest, both girls not budging an inch. Internally sighing, Yuki's headache returned. It seemed Yuno was aware of her surroundings. Enough already. We don't have time to fight amongst ourselves. Separating both girls, Yuki didn't want this conflict to escalate into physical blows and scratches. Understanding women was a lost cause, he needed to step in and take charge, otherwise, blood would be the only outcome. Est, return to my spiritual world. Our next enemy is decided. Yes, master. Though a bit reluctant, Est nodded and entered Yuki's spiritual world. However, before leaving, she gave Yuno a deep look. Est wasn't afraid. Rather, she openly challenged Yuno, displaying something different from her usual emotionless demeanor. Even though she often played with Mana in the God's world, Yuno had a bad feeling, especially about those eyes that frequently lost their light. No matter, I'll protect the master. Thinking this, S disappeared, she would always be with Yuki. If anything happened, she would be the first to intervene. Yuki. You shouldn't summon her anymore. Please end your contract with her. Don't talk nonsense, you know. It's impossible to end my contract with EST. 
Shaking his head, Yuki gave her a blank look. He would be an idiot to end his contract with Est over a harem dispute. You know, on the other hand, bit her lips, she was jealous, very jealous of Est. After all, she shared with Yuki a connection beyond physical contact, they shared a spiritual space and were connected on a soul level. Est had what Yuno wanted most, to be with Yuki for all eternity. It's okay. I'll let you enjoy your position for now. Taking a deep breath, Yuno smiled again. You shouldn't fight with Est, Yuno. She's not your enemy. Okay, Yuki. I'll do as you say. Responding with a smile, Yuno blinked cutely at Yuki, who sighed in response. He could see that his words went in one ear and out the other. She eathed. Fortunately, Yuno's diary sounded, breaking the awkward atmosphere. Hmm well, it seems our guest is about to arrive. Hearing this sound, Yuki wasn't surprised at all. If his calculations were correct, his guinea pig would enter the scene. Guest. Unable to comprehend Yuki's words, Yuno tilted her head, and her mind wandered. This hotel was abandoned in a different city, and no one, besides the two of them, knew they were hiding here. No one should be able to find them since both traveled through Yuki's shadow and had no contact with other people. Unable to contain her curiosity, Yuno checked her diary, and her expression couldn't help but doubt. Yuki. An enemy. No, she's a guest. While Yuno raised her katana, Yuki smiled as several teacups and snacks emerged from his shadow, arranged for their guest. Talk, talk. The guest didn't make them wait long, a gentle knock was heard on the door. Yuki. Calm down, Yuno. Let me handle this. Lower that katana. But. Even with Yuki's words, Yuno couldn't calm her anxiety. A nuclear bomb was beyond the door of her room. Yuno knew how terrible the other participants could be, if they did nothing, the game for them could end. However, Yuki eased her anxiety by hugging her tightly, whispering in her ear. I understand your concern, but I need you to trust me, you know. Or do you not trust me? Yes. I trust Yuki. Then lower that katana and leave everything to me. This time, you know couldn't retort. After all, she trusted Yuki more than herself. Yuki was someone who, through messages and support, helped her overcome that damn cage. A person who, even in different worlds, gave her the attention and love she needed most. Thanks to Yuki, she had the courage to confront her parents and escape from that prison. She owed him, loved him more than anything, and she had to protect him, kill any enemy trying to separate them. However, Yuki's words struck her deep, as if he knew exactly which words were effective in tying her hands and making her unable to retort. After all, if she refused to disobey him, it meant she didn't trust Yuki, and cracks in their relationship would open over time, possibly becoming irreparable. This was what Yuno feared most. Well. I'll do what you say, Yuki. Lowering her head along with her katana, Yuno murmured. Good, good girl. Cradling her beautiful hair, Yuki lifted her chin and gave her a quick kiss. He knew exactly what this girl was thinking. After all, they had been chatting for more than two years. Although it was only a few days for Yuno, it was a long time for Yuki. In those messages, Yuki took the opportunity to study her, delve into her deepest secrets. This girl was an open book to him, telling him everything as long as Yuki asked. Yuki knew her better than she knew herself. That's why his sweet and double-edged words were a lethal poison for this girl, unable to disobey him. It was dirty, as Yuki played with Yuno's feelings, but it was necessary if he wanted to keep this mentally unstable girl on a leash. And although Yuki maintained his soft smile, inside, he was sweating cold because Yuno's gaze flickered frequently, as if she was in conflict with herself. Fortunately for him, Yuno didn't hit him. This made him inwardly sigh while cracking his fingers, where a white hand emerged from the shadows, opening the door. Behind it, a beautiful girl with long black hair, dressed in a kimono, was revealed. Welcome to our humble abode, Miss Sabeki Kajigino. We were expecting you. Yes, the guest was none other than Sixth, the owner of the clairvoyance diary. Needless to say, Tsubaki was surprised to see them. After all, there were both Yuki and Yuno, 
sitting around a table, having tea and snacks, welcoming her. This was something she didn't expect, as it seemed they were waiting for her arrival. She was even more surprised when she saw Yuki's beautiful face, her eyes couldn't help but sparkle, and her cheeks warmed slightly. She never expected the key to be such a beautiful boy, after all, her diary described him as a horrible giant monster. But no. Calm down. I came to negotiate. Thank you for your kind invitation. With your permission. Bowing slightly, Tsubaki entered the room, her gaze wandering around before settling on Yuki. This look didn't go unnoticed by Yuno, who, in response, clenched her fist. Unfortunately, that was all she could do since she had given her word to Yuki not to intervene, unless, of course, this woman turned hostile. But seeing the gentle smile on Yuki's face, it was highly unlikely that would happen. What are you planning, Yuki? She didn't know, but one thing she was sure of. Tsubaki finding them was because of Yuki. More precisely, Tsubaki was here because of Yuki. Something must have happened for this woman to dare come alone to the wolf's den. Even if she brought someone else with her, it would be futile. Regulars were powerless against tectonic mediums. There was simply no comparison between them. Chapter 284, Tsubaki Kajigano Do you want tea? Yes, please. After letting her in, introducing themselves, and inviting her for tea, the trio enjoyed a pleasant moment of silence. No one spoke, just relishing the moment, as if they were a trio of friends rarely meeting. Despite her doubts, Tsubaki accepted Yuki's tea but, of course, didn't ingest anything. Instead, she used her ability, creating a small spatial rift, making everything that entered her mouth disappear. She wasn't foolish, who knows if that drink contained poison or not. This is a game of survival. Everyone is an enemy until this game ends, unless, of course, there's an alliance or some kind of benefit that unites them to work together. And even though she faced two nuclear bombs, she shouldn't be underestimated. While pretending to drink, she stole glances at Yuki. As expected of a god, creating such a person. Just like the 11th, Tsubaki mistakenly thought that Deus had created Yuki, being the key to the survival game. The misunderstanding was to be expected. But unlike the 11th, who was surprised by Yuki's power and ability, she was amazed by his beauty and elegance. Yuki emitted an aura that set him apart from everyone, a light that illuminated the darkness. That's how Tsubaki described Yuki. Someone pure. She even thought he might not be human, as such light wasn't something humans could bear. An example would be Yuno, her aura was too chaotic and unstable that Tsubaki thought she was on a roller coaster. Another thing that intrigued her is. Why is the key a man or why is he flesh and blood why are his eyes heterochromatic wouldn't it be more practical if it were a tool, aiding the second in her victory, something that would increase her power is it possible that Yuno requested it this way seeing how Yuno exchanged glances and even the emotional dependence she emitted, Tsubaki thought that was the case. Deus created the perfect man for Yuno. Not like I can't understand it. Understanding this fact, Tsubaki didn't judge her. She knew how terrible and ugly humans could be. If she had the chance to have someone who would never betray her, Tsubaki would wish for the same. So she understood Yuno and looked at her sympathetically. Yuno, on the other hand, frowned, and the light in her eyes dimmed. However, this didn't last long as Yuki decided to break the silence. And what brings you to this place? Miss Sabeki. Don't you know I believe I heard that you were waiting for me. Raising an eyebrow, Sabeki lowered her teacup. After all, it was obvious that this duo was waiting for her, and Yuki himself mentioned it, so it was logical that they knew about her circumstances. Yes, but I would like to hear your circumstances from you. Of course, Yuki knew. Moreover, due to those circumstances, Yuki guided her to this place. However, it was Tsubaki who needed their help more than the other way around, so she had to speak plainly. I understand, sighing slightly, Tsubaki understood Yuki's point. Although she would like to talk directly with Yuno, Yuki was controlling the situation, so she couldn't do anything but accept his request. She then brought a hand to her red kimono to avoid beating around the bush. However, her action was misinterpreted by Yuno, who tightened her grip on her katana, ready to attack. Fortunately, 
Yuki prevented her from continuing by placing a hand on hers. This is the reason for my visit. Tsubaki pretended not to notice the situation, directly showing her future diary. Or rather, showing the huge dead end. So that's the case. Nodding, Yuki was right, his calculations didn't fail him. The sixth diary is a scroll, so its dead end was visible. Even Yuno opened her eyes when she saw this. As you can see, I'll die in two hours. I understand. But what does that have to do with us? Indeed, even if she were to die, it had no direct relation to them. This is a survival game, deaths are mandatory. Whether she dies or not is irrelevant to them. It has a lot of importance, Yuki-kun. If I die, the ninth will be stronger, and surely her next targets will be both of you. I'm sure this is not something that benefits you. Yes, although her death didn't directly affect them, it did indirectly. The ninth is already powerful by killing a participant, if she manages to kill another, her power would enter a new stage. And this is something you know and Yuki need to avoid. By coming here, I suppose you have something in mind. That's right, Yuki-kun. I propose a deal. My death is not something that benefits us both. I want you to protect me until this survival game ends. Listening to this irrational demand, both Yuki and Yuno raised their eyebrows. This girl was asking for something irrelevant asking your enemy to protect you, surely, this girl has thick skin. Wouldn't it be simpler if we kill you and end this? Growling in response, Yuno unsheathed her katana. Indeed, even if her death negatively affected them, that would only happen if another participant killed her. If they did it, it would be beneficial as they wouldn't have to watch their backs for another participant, and they would also avoid one less headache, like preventing the ninth from gaining more power. In a sense, if they killed her, it was the best course of action to take and would avoid taking another burden as well as a possible backstabber. I knew you would say that, Gaze san But if you kill me, your problems won't end, as in exchange for your protection, I offer my power. You cover my sword, and I cover yours. I'm sure you need manpower, Gaze san you can't gain more power. If we work together and eliminate the rest of the participants, ending this absurd game would be just around the corner. Also, my diary is not weak, I offer information as well as an army. This city could very well be our fortress. It was a good deal with many risks, as Tsubeki said, they lacked manpower. Yuki had to be careful not to be trapped by the Demon King, and Yuno couldn't steal power, making them vulnerable to other participants. Working with Tsubeki would bring them an overwhelming advantage, with three nuclear bombs, even the ninth wouldn't be a threat. But there were risks. If we agree, who will take care of killing the participants? Of course, it will be you, Yuki-kun. It would be complete foolishness if they took care of weakening the enemy only for Tsubeki to deliver the final blow. It's like shooting themselves in the foot. Yuki-kun, Gaze-san, I have no ambition to become a god. I am a Maiko, a messenger of the gods. It would be blasphemy to attempt to occupy the god's throne. Although I'm sure you already know this, all I want is to live and nothing more. If what she said was true, then this alliance was a bargain. They could exploit and use Tsubeki as bait, covering their backs while Tsubeki lived. Of course, if she is sincere. No, I can't trust her, Yuki. Shaking her head, Yuno was the first to decline. Her instincts told her she couldn't trust that woman. That look and confidence were not something someone on the brink of death possessed. She's too calm and cool as a cucumber. She's planning something. You don't have to worry, Gaze san It's impossible for me to betray you. After all, I wouldn't want to be the next one to wield the key. As Tsubeki said, if for some reason she manages to kill Yuno, she would be the next to wield the winning key. However, with that, she would also be the final target of the other participants. Since she can't steal power, she would be a sitting duck by then. For someone who says she wants to live, doing this is stupid. Well, I accept the deal. Yuki. Turning his head, Yuno looked at him incredulously. It was clear that this woman was planning something, but even so, Yuki accepted her demands. This was something Yuno couldn't accept. However, when she was about to retort, Yuki returned her gaze, preventing her from speaking again. 
Miss Sabeki wants to live, that's reason enough to help her. Chapter 285, I entrusted him my life. I appreciate your consideration. Bowing slightly, Sabeki sighed inwardly. Truth be told, she was scared. This situation wasn't favorable for her, she was caught between a rock and a hard place. Seeking support from Yuno was her last hope, so she staked everything on this visit. Running was futile against the future diary, and she lacked the strength to protect herself. If she wanted to live, she had to find someone to support and shield her. That someone was Yuno, only she had no need to kill Tsubaki. Her death wouldn't bring Yuno any benefit, no power to gain, and fighting her would diminish Yuno's vitality, it would be a loss. Only Yuno was someone she could trust. Yuno was her only way out. If she could cling to Yuno's side, there was a chance to turn the tables. If everything went as planned, victory was within her grasp. If not, she would still live, as Yuno didn't need to kill her to win. But the risk was substantial, the possibility of being killed was high. Fortunately, everything unfolded as she envisioned, although she was surprised that the key was a man. That didn't change anything, he seemed even more tolerable than Yuno and more discerning. We accept the deal, but I have a condition. Raising a finger, Yuki smiled. After all, this girl would be his guinea pig. If she survived, the remaining time depended on her. A condition of course, if it's within my power, I'll fulfill my part. It's something very simple, don't worry. But I can't fully trust you, so I'd like to have your diary. Pointing to her diary, Yuki tilted his head. He had read in Raziel how powerful this girl's diary was. The diary of clairvoyance. It was both terrifying and useful if you knew how to use it. Although it wasn't as useful for Yuki, who possessed Raziel, he had other reasons. Staring at him for a few seconds, Tsubaki shrugged. It was natural, they had just met, and forming an alliance in these circumstances was impossible. There had to be guarantees. Tsubaki understood, but she was reluctant to hand over her diary. After all, her diary was also a weakness, if it was damaged, she would die. Giving away her diary was equivalent to handing over her life. What's wrong Yuki asked for your diary? If you don't give it, I won't trust you. Prompting Tsubaki to respond, Yuno stretched out her hand, a smile forming on her face. She now understood, Tsubaki was the life insurance Yuki mentioned. If Tsubaki handed over her diary, it was like having a nuclear bomb wagging its tail for you. If she didn't, well, there was always the option of killing her, and Yuno was hoping she wouldn't hand it over. That would give no excuse not to kill her. Unfortunately, Tsubaki disappointed her. Fine. I entrust my life to you, Yuki-kun. I hope my sincerity is conveyed through this. Clasping her hands together, Tsubaki bowed and handed over her diary. She had no way out, so Tsubaki staked everything. She could see that Yuno would cut her down if she didn't hand over her diary. Even if she managed to escape, she would still die at the hands of the Ninth. Her fate and future were sealed. Might as well hand her life over to this pretty boy. Yes, I promise I won't let you die, as long as you don't break this deal. I'll protect you. Smiling, Yuki took Tsubaki's extended hand and shook it, offering comfort. With his other hand, he held the diary. You've suffered too much. Let me take care of things from now on. To be honest, Yuki pitied this girl. He had read about her past in Raziel and found it very unfortunate. Her life had been a tool, used by her parents to create that strange sect. Exploiting her birth condition, her parents were killed two years ago, and she was violated by sect members as an act of purification. A 12-year-old girl violated by several men, including those from different countries who flocked to her sect just to defile her. Her life was truly lamentable. Although Yuno also had her own lamentable past, both had suffered in their own ways. Yuno from the lack of love and Tsubaki from having and losing it. There were many reasons why Yuki chose her, but one of them was her tragic life. Even though Yuki wasn't a hero, it was still good to perform kind acts for the sake of increasing his karma. Yuki-kun. You. Lifting her head, Tsubaki's body trembled. Those words meant so much. 
What exactly does Yuki know does he know about her sin does he know she's not pure thinking about it, Tsubaki couldn't help but step back a bit, but her hand was firmly held by Yuki. Don't be afraid. We all live and suffer, it's the law of life. But even in suffering, we must rise. That's what makes us human. After saying that, Yuki let go of her hands. At the same time, he opened the diary of clairvoyance, unaware that his words had struck Tsubaki's heart hard. After all, there's no woman in the world who doesn't enjoy romance. On the other hand, Yuno was reaching the end of her patience. This woman was taking advantage of Yuki's kindness. This woman. I hate her. 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 She knew it, Yuki was kind and generous, willing to lend a hand to a pitiable girl like her. But this woman was exploiting that kindness, and from the conflicted look on her face, Yuno knew she had an unsavory past. But even if she was a pitiable woman, that had nothing to do with Yuki. No matter her pain, she shouldn't drag Yuki into her mess. If only this woman would disappear. Yes, let's kill her. That's why she was grinding her teeth. However, a hand squeezed hers, causing her body to stop trembling. Yuki. Turning her head, Yuno found Yuki smiling at her. Don't forget, Yuno, you're the reason I came to this world. Yes, Yuki was in this world for her and no one else. He was fighting for her. Even if another woman appeared, it was indisputable that Yuki was protecting her. Yuki, as if remembering, Yuno's eyes became watery, and she hugged him tightly. Right. Yuki is here for me. Murmuring to herself, Yuno felt foolish for being jealous of a woman she had just met. It was evident that Yuki was planning his next move. Tsubaki, witnessing their affectionate display, couldn't help but twist her smile a bit. They didn't hesitate to show their affection, but what could she say separate them no, she didn't want to die. All right, let's get down to business. Breaking free from Yuno's embrace, Yuki extended the diary of clairvoyance for the trio to see and learn more about Tsubaki's situation. We still have two hours before the dead end. That's more than enough time to eliminate the enemy. Quickly analyzing the information, Yuki brought a hand to his chin as his eyes gleamed. This diary contained precious information. That's correct, I have two hours. Nodding in agreement, Tsubaki confirmed his words. All right, then let's do it. Miss Tsubaki, we need you to guide us to your section. Eh. Unable to comprehend his words, Tsubaki opened her mouth in shock, this was too much for her. The best defense is the offense, Miss Tsubaki. The faster we finish off the enemy, the better. Seeing her open mouth shock, Yuki explained his rationale. Indeed, this dead end was the perfect time to alter the future. Their prey would take the bait, falling into the trap. Tsubaki, on the other hand, felt all the strength drain from her body. Initially, she planned to wait here until the dead end disappeared. If that didn't work, she would stay and live in this place, which was safer than waiting for another participant's ambush. But now, she was starting to regret seeking help. What good was it to ask for assistance if, in the end, they treated her like bait however, crying over spilled milk served no purpose. This was her decision, after all. Survival depended on her now. Honestly, Yuno was mocking her misfortune. Let's go for that dog. While Tsubaki was regretting and Yuno was mocking, Yuki had already begun weaving his net, and the first victim had fallen. Chapter 286, She is Useful. City Sakurami, Omekata Temple. Omekata Temple serves as the headquarters of the Omekata religion, located on the outskirts of the city, shielding it from the city's disturbances. With various gardens, water pools, and fish, it conveyed a serene and peaceful impression, contrary to its actual activities. Even Yuki considered it not a bad place for a secluded life. Despite being a relatively new religion, Omekata was affluent, supported by many who believed in their Maiko or the seer of the gods. Originally founded to assist the weak and troubled, the religion faced a turn of events two years ago when its original leaders passed away, leaving the Maiko as the new leader. Inside a secluded and restricted room within the temple, Tsubaki, the Maiko, resided. She was believed never to leave, driven by her fear of the outside world. 
Sabaki sighed within the confines of her room, forced to return to the cell. Things never go as one wishes. Smiling bitterly, she reflected on how this temple brought her both joy and suffering more than any other place. Unfortunately, she had to return, losing her future diary as her only consolation, her shadow flickering as if trying to comfort her. Don't get down. I said I'd protect you, so cheer up. I understand, Yuki-kun. I'm not worried about that. In that shadow, both Yuki and Yuno concealed themselves, awaiting the moment when their prey took the bait. However, Tsubaki found the situation a headache, as she had to endure being treated as bait. Yet, if she wanted to live, this was a small price to pay. Yuki, it's necessary to have her with us. I don't trust her. You know, holding Yuki's arm, couldn't help but comment, considering her both an opponent and a pretty girl of the same age, adding more points to Yuno's radar for elimination. She's useful. Yuki, on the other hand, thought Sabaki was perfect for the job. Among all participants, she showed the most promise and met his expectations. A powerful woman. Attractive figure, enough to catch his eyes. Similar age to Yuno. A dark past. Not a bad personality. Moreover, seducing her wouldn't be a problem, as her guard around men wasn't very high. Above all, she was perfect for at least slightly easing Yuno's dependency. That's why he didn't hesitate to draw her to his side, leaving clues about his whereabouts and trapping her in this web. Even though the Ninth was a woman and fulfilled one of his objectives, it wasn't feasible as she behaved hostily. Tsubaki was the best choice. She's dangerous, Yuki. She's going to betray us. Don't worry about that. We have her diary, and in her body, I've left a safety. She absolutely won't betray us, I'll take care of that. Even with Yuki having her diary, the likelihood of betrayal was high. Thus, Yuki didn't trust her, infecting her with the apocalypse virus. Any abnormal action from her, and the virus in her body would activate, crystallizing her body without any chance of resistance. However, Yuki believed he wouldn't need such a countermeasure. Tsubaki was a pitiable girl who needed a lot of support and, of course, an emotional pillar. In that sense, she and Yuno were very similar. Both needed the same. She eeth. But as they conversed in the shadows, Yuki's diary rang, and the entries in the clairvoyance diary changed. It's time. The prey entered the trap. Smirking maliciously, Yuki licked his lips. Get ready, Miss Sabeki. The enemy has arrived. All right, I'm counting on you, Yuki-kun. Opening her eyes, Sabeki broke into a cold sweat as her enemy appeared. Initially, she thought the ninth was her enemy, but she was terribly wrong. The ninth was the least of her worries. Dash. Everything is ready. It's time to start the game. In a spacious room, a middle-aged man of around 40, with a serious appearance, cropped brown hair, dressed in outdated clothes, murmured while looking ahead, where hundreds of small screens illuminated. This man is Karyado Tsukishima, 10th, owner of the Parenting Diary. Everything is going according to plan. Stroking his mustache, the man watched as hundreds of people lined up and prayed in the temple. Omekata religion was very popular, and despite many deaths yesterday due to the city's disturbance and destruction, many people gathered in this temple, seeking spiritual support as they had lost family and loved ones. However, none of that mattered to the tenth, as his target was the Maiko of that religion. To be more precise, the sixth. Of course, it's going according to plan. Why would you doubt me I'm an elite? Responding to his murmurs, a voice came from his phone, sounding like that of a child. The tenth, on the other hand, didn't respond. Still, he had to admit that his partner was very intelligent, easily finding the hiding place of a participant in the survival game, as well as preparing countermeasures against his own pursuer. This child gave him several surprises, and he had to acknowledge that the thinking and imagination were superior, despite being a child. Remember that after finishing this, you must help me get rid of that detective. Of course, when we're done with this, killing that Ajizan won't be a problem. After exchanging a few more words, the call ended, making the tenth sigh and furrow his brow while looking at the hundreds of screens in front of him. Many people would die today, 
but none of that concerned him. His only concern was that the sixth wasn't the only participant in that temple, she was accompanied by the second. The person who had killed two participants, and if not for the rules preventing Yuno from accumulating more power, the tenth would avoid this girl at all costs. However, due to his own issues and the mission having a high chance of success, the tenth accepted this job, or rather this request. I hope everything goes according to plan. Closing his eyes slightly, the tenth mentally gave an order, initiating the operation. Dash. He he he, I can't wait anymore. While the tenth side, a child of about five to seven years old, dressed in a green overall with a white shirt underneath and a matching green cap. His eyes are green, his skin is tan, and he always has rosy cheeks. His ginger-colored hair and in his hands, he carries two puppets a man and a woman. Waving his puppets, he looked into the distance, where Omekata Temple stood. This child's name is Reja Kaujao, a participant in this survival game. This child is the fifth and the youngest in this game. Despite being the youngest, the tenth praised his intelligence. It had been about eleven hours since he awakened his powers, and as expected, it turned out to be a marvel. With his ability to control time, he played with it a couple of times before discovering that it consumed his vitality. However, being a child, Rajak didn't care much. Thanks to his games, he managed to escape danger as the city center was devastated, killing thousands of people. Among those people were his parents. It bothered him a bit, and although he didn't care much for his parents, who often fought, leaving a negative image of them, making him learn to be independent from an early age, they were still his family. Their death affected him emotionally and physically since he had seen his future. If he did nothing and played the survival game, his only future would be an orphanage, and perhaps, with luck, a family would adopt him. But the time he had to spend alone for that was too much. Chapter 287, Anger In the face of impending danger, Rajak had no choice but to fight for his destiny. Driven by a desire for both enjoyment and the possibility of avenging his parents' deaths, he maximized the use of his supervision diary and abilities. Swiftly, he identified the murderer of his parents, Yuno Gaze, the second, and the key bearer. Upon gathering more information, he instantly realized he stood no chance against Yuno. She was formidable, and even with the use of his powers, he would still lose. Instead of giving up, he found excitement in the survival game, which turned out to be more thrilling than he had anticipated. Realizing he couldn't defeat Yuno alone, he sought other participants to form alliances. Soon, he found a tenth, who seemed to have his own troubles as the fourth was apparently hunting him. After they met, both agreed to form an alliance, given their similar powers and shared troublesome enemies. After discussing their issues, Rajak proposed a solution, find another participant and eliminate them. It would be great if the opponent were weak, allowing them to absorb their power. With more power, their enemies would eventually be eliminated. The tenth accepted this plan, surprised that Rajak had already found the perfect victim, the sixth. Despite her powerful ability to create an army, she was the weakest remaining participant. They formed an alliance, but to their dismay, the sixth had also allied with Yuno. Complicating matters for the tenth, Rajak had different plans. With two participants in the same location, their rewards would be greater. He also saw an opportunity to avenge his parents and proposed another plan, urging the tenth to support him. In the new plan, they would attack the Omakata religion headquarters, bringing out troublesome enemies from their hiding place. Although both were formidable foes, they had their disadvantages. Yuno was dangerous, but her weakness was clear, the key. Furthermore, Rajak had another small plan that couldn't fail. Oni-chan is strong. But not so strong against the three of us, right? Smirking cruelly, Rajak watched as hundreds of dogs rushed toward the temple. Now, ninth Oni-chan, I hope this is enough to get your attention. Whispering softly, Rajak's body flickered, instantly disappearing. Dash dash. Here they come. Frowning, Yuki observed from the shadows as hundreds of enhanced dogs surrounded the Omekata temple. These were no ordinary dogs, the energy emanating from their bodies caught Yuki's attention. Moreover, their energy resembled something familiar the power of time. Bark. Bark. Roar. 
The barks and occasional roars filled the air as the dogs charged toward the temple and the crowd of people, massacring them. As regulars, they stood no chance against the upgraded dogs with incredible speed. Well. Let's see how long they can last. Performing a series of hand signs, Yuki initiated the first phase of his plan. Several bomb-laden papers around the village lit up, causing a powerful explosion that killed both people and dogs. This temple was a trap. Yuki couldn't let those dogs enter the temple freely without consequences. Fortunately, the explosion didn't affect the main temple where Tsubaki was located. My darlings. Watching the video and her diary simultaneously, Tsubaki jumped in surprise as she witnessed her precious dogs die from the explosive impact of the bomb-laden papers. She couldn't comprehend how this happened, considering her dogs were trained to detect bombs and abnormalities. This training should have prompted them to escape at the first sign of danger. However, neither her diary nor the dogs detected these bombs. This left her bewildered, as her diary constantly changed its entries. Her diary, the diary of rearing, allowed her to predict things related to her pets their location, the timing of their attacks, and aspects related to their upbringing. It was a limited diary, relying heavily on the pets to foresee the future. In a sense, her diary resembled Tsubaki's diary, as it could only predict what her dogs observed. There was another limitation, if the dogs didn't detect something dangerous, the diary would only record what the dogs saw. Not knowing about the bomb-laden papers proved to be a fatal error. It allowed the dogs to continue their attack, only to perish in the explosion. Yuki knew about this vulnerability and exploited it to the fullest, blinding tenth. Without her dogs, her diary would be useless. However, Yuki was aware that this wasn't the end. Decimo didn't stay idle. How dare you you dare to kill my darlings. Shouting in anger, several veins formed on Decimo's forehead. Indifferent to humans, he had isolated himself from his family due to his individualistic attitude, despite being rich and a knight. He lost his composure at seeing his dogs die. If there was anything Decimo cared about, it was his pets. For him, his pets were family important beings. Unlike humans, dogs were loyal and didn't betray you. They were the best friends he could ask for. But those friends of his died quickly in an explosion. You'll regret this. This is far from over. Clenching his fist, a powerful energy surged from within him, depleting his vitality. Simultaneously, the corpses of the dogs were healing at an incredible speed. Not only that, but the debris and people were returning to their original positions, as if a camera were rewinding a scene. He reversed time. Indeed, Decimo was reversing time, and judging by the amount of power used, even Yuki shuddered at the thought of the vitality Decimo expended on that ability. This guy didn't hesitate for a second to bring his dogs back to life. Or at least, that's what it seemed like. Because not all the dogs could stand up and growl. Many of them, with intact bodies, lay motionless on the ground. I see, the same limitations. Yuki could understand what was happening. Those that could stand up and growl were the dogs that didn't die instantly in the explosion. The others were logically dead, even though their bodies were intact. Their souls had already left their bodies. By reversing time as Decimo did, he couldn't bring back their souls. Doing so would violate the laws of the world, just as controlling an entirely different power would. The power of life and death. Yuki knew this because in the past, he had also tried to bring his mother back to life but failed. The only thing he could do to bring her back was to prevent her death by traveling to the past or altering reality, using Izanagi. Unfortunately, Decimo didn't have the Sherry Non, so using Izanagi was impossible. As for time travel, it was even more unlikely, as the shield protecting the world prevented the creation of alternate timelines. This was the power of the absolute shield. After all, with so many overlords and astonishing powers, preventing their enemies from escaping or creating another temporal line was vital for them. Why why aren't they moving? Although Yuki knew the cause, Decimo did not. With his diary, he could clearly read that his pet's bodies were in perfect condition, just as they were seconds ago. However, they couldn't move. This puzzled him, and he trembled with anger. He could see that his power was not entirely invincible. But also, his cherished pets would not return. I'll kill you. Grinding his teeth, 
Decimo gave a mental command, and another group of dogs stealthily approached the temple. Second, sixth. Both must die. Chapter 288, Timeline. Tokyo, Japan. Hmm. Furrowing her brow, Novena detected faint energy pulses. I think I took the wrong route. Mining, having killed a participant, had been hunting to gain more power. After all, Yuno was more powerful than predicted, especially the key. That child was a problem, and if she wanted to kill them, she needed to at least double her powers, otherwise, the chances of winning were less than 50%. However, her attempts to detect other participants had failed. Her diary, being a special one, made escape difficult in this task. But she didn't give up and searched from city to city for the mice. Since she thought that Sakurami city, being previously destroyed, no participant would dare to stay. But now it seems she made a mistake, as the energy pulses come directly from that direction. I understand, the most dangerous place is the safest. Following this logic, Mining smiled before her body flickered and disappeared. The hunt had begun. BOMM. You're quite stubborn. Activating more of his bomb papers, massacring more dogs. The dogs didn't wait to die either, as their bodies moved at high speed, biting people and destroying the temple. Tenth, having the power of time, was distributing power among his pets, making them very difficult to kill. Yuki, of course, didn't panic, as with the Sherry Non, he observed the movements of each pet. Well, the moment has come. I leave it to you, you know. After analyzing and detecting the time waves, Yuki located 10th. After all, the information Raziel gave him was very ambiguous and lacked meaning. It seemed 10th was hiding within time, so Raziel couldn't detect his whereabouts perfectly. Still, that didn't mean Zafkiel couldn't. And now, with the constant use of time power, it was more than enough for Yuki to detect 10th. Yes, Yuki. I won't let you down. Smiling in response, Yuno unsheathed her katana ready to kill. Miss Sabeki, as we planned, we'll split up at this point. Please endure for as long as necessary. I will, I don't want to die. Smiling bitterly, Sabeki had no choice but to nod. This part of the plan was the one she didn't like. For her, the death of the followers of her sect didn't matter. However, at this moment, Yuki would face one of his enemies separately, forcing her to remain in a stalemate with Yuno. And although she'd like to run, she couldn't. Because the consequences would be disastrous if her position was compromised. Well, I wish you both good luck. Tic-tac. Entering his astral suit, Yuki invoked Zafkiel, and his body sank into the shadows. After entering the shadows, Yuki quickly captured one of Tenth's pets. If he wanted to find Tenth, the first thing to do was mark his energy source. The pets were like phones receiving signals through a tower, and if Yuki wanted to find the energy source, he had to make the signal increasingly intense. The death of the dogs played a crucial role, forcing Tenth to amplify his signal by reversing time. There was no doubt that Raziel's information played a crucial role because with it, Yuki knew how important the dogs were to Tenth, treating them even better than his family. However, this time, the dogs were his downfall. With his sherry non-spinning, Yuki put one of the dogs to sleep, activating his genjutsu. I got you. Zafkiel, Ted. Since the dogs were the receptors of his power and consequently the only way to find him, knowing this, Yuki didn't hesitate to interrupt the signal and enter Tenth's timeline. And what better way to do it than to share senses and form beyond time? The ninth bullet was perfect for this, so he shot towards the energy receptor, which was the pet with the strongest signal. Wow. This is unexpected. To think that someone would manage to enter this timeline, and I must say it's a very unusual guest. Opening his eyes, Yuki saw directly at a middle-aged man, dressed in an old-fashioned yet elegant way, sitting drinking tea while several dogs surrounded him. Hundreds of screens blinked around him. He was so calm that it was obvious he was expecting it. However, this didn't surprise Yuki, as this was also within his calculations. Tenth's diary was that of upbringing, so he knew exactly what would happen to each of his pets. Thanks for receiving me. Bowing slightly, Yuki introduced himself as a true gentleman. 
he could see that the person in front of him also had that noble aura. Although such people are rare in the modern world, the simple fact that he wasn't scared was commendable. Although you're an unwelcome guest, I like your attitude. What do you say we join forces, key together, the odds of winning this game are high. With a hand on his chin, Tenth studied the key from top to bottom. This little one also had a dignified aura, so Tenth quickly tried to bring him to his side. He must know that knights in this era are so scarce that encountering one of their own is difficult, but now Yuki was here. I'm sorry, but I already have a lady to protect. My loyalty is with her. Rejected without hesitation, Yuki materialized his spark gun. After all, he wasn't here to talk. It's a pity, together, we would be invincible. But I understand. Our honor as knights prevents us from betraying our beliefs. However, I doubt very much that you can fulfill the mission your lady gave you in that state. Raising an eyebrow, Tenth wasn't worried to see the spark gun in Yuki's hand. After all, he is the creator of this timeline. And he knew exactly that Yuki wasn't in this timeline with his real body. Rather, a part of his consciousness dragged through his signal, allowing him to enter this place, like a virus in a wireless network. That's why Tenth was so calm, in that state, it was useless for Yuki to try anything. Yuki, on the other hand, shrugged. He knew exactly what Tenth meant. Reaching this timeline wasn't easy, especially with the amount of chakra it took Zafkiel to bring him here. And although it was only his consciousness and senses, it was more than enough. Who knows? Maybe I can't do anything in this state. Smirking mischievously, Yuki lowered his gaze where the king's mark, as well as the est contract mark, joined. But I never said it would be me making a move. Shiyayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
his worries vanished upon knowing that as a knight, he had a lady to protect. Yuki, as a knight, wouldn't give up, victory was within reach. With these thoughts, the timeline collapsed. Boom. Tenth had died. Dash dash. Ha. Ha. Breathing heavily, Yuki knelt down, the amount of chakra he used in that final attack was immense. Destroying an entire timeline, this feat alone was incredible. Although it wasn't necessarily a globally significant timeline, but a small one the size of a room, it was more than enough to be proud of. However, it was necessary, otherwise, killing Tenth would have been impossible. Locating his position using Genjutsu with the Sherinan, using the ninth bullet to send his consciousness to the timeline where Tenth hid was risky and dangerous. A single mistake, and his consciousness would be destroyed through the waves. Synchronizing with Est and activating her Jutsu, waiting for the opportune moment to call her through his consciousness into Tenth's timeline, was exhausting. Yuki knew that using only his consciousness, it was impossible to defeat Tenth hiding in that timeline using his body. However, thanks to his contract, Est could enter that timeline through Yuki's consciousness, even though the risk was significant. Fortunately, they succeeded. Their plan to kill the rat in the hole was a success. Est, return to my spiritual world, we can't leave that place alone for too long. I know, master. Acknowledging his orders, Est returned to the spiritual world, also keeping an eye on the Sephira crystal. The Demon King was bad news after all. Moreover, Tenth's final warning was unexpected and carried much weight. For Fifth, who possessed the power of time, Yuki knew how troublesome that kid could be. Boom. However, Yuki had no time to rest as another explosion echoed throughout the area. At the same time Yuki disappeared into the shadows, both Yuno and Tsubaki raised their guard, they knew their next opponents would be tough. I'm counting on you, Gaze-san. Turning her head to her companion, Tsubaki couldn't help but remind her. Unlike Yuki, Yuno was challenging to deal with. I don't like you. But Yuki said to protect you, so don't talk to me. I'm not your comrade. Also, stay close, it would be a problem if you died. As Tsubaki expected, Yuno didn't see her as a companion but more as baggage. Nevertheless, Tsubaki just shrugged. After all, Yuno's aura was dangerous, and Tsubaki had no doubt that Yuno was stronger than her. She also felt nervous because at this rate, they were heading towards their dead end, which worried her the most. Without Yuki around, she had to grit her teeth, even though she didn't want to, she had to trust Yuno. Yuno was also irritated, taking care of this woman was a hassle. If it weren't for Yuki's request, she would have already killed her to continue with their lives and prevent her from becoming a problem. Hmm. Suddenly, Yuno furrowed her brow, sensing something abnormal in the air. Although she didn't know what it was, her instincts started tingling. S-H-I-I-I-I-I-I. As if responding to her instincts, her diary started to beep. Without wasting time, Yuno read the entries on her phone, and her expression sank. Fast-acting poison. Eh. Without giving a second glance to Tsubaki, Yuno grabbed her and ran. Tsubaki, who still didn't understand what was happening, couldn't help but open her mouth. Nevertheless, she followed Yuno, after all, she didn't have her diary, and even if she did, almost all the regulars had died, rendering her diary useless. Kukiku. As expected of second Oni-chan, it's very difficult. Hidden in the shadows, a child wearing a gas mask smiled. He looked at his diary, where the drawings of two women running were evident. Due to the colors and shapes, it was clear that these two drawings belonged to Yuno and Tsubaki. With Yuki pursuing 10th, Rajak knew it was his chance to attack. Although he knew he couldn't face Yuno and Tsubaki head on, it didn't mean he couldn't use tricks, such as poison. It might be that their bodies had undergone reconstruction and were stronger, but that didn't make them invincible. Also, the poison had to be effective. Hmm. But as he looked at his diary, the entries changed, showing both drawings stopping, and a sphere formed around them. This is how it should be. Come, use your powers, Ninth Oni-chan, I leave them to you. This should be enough. Creating a sphere around them, Tsubaki altered space, enclosing both of them in a kind of barrier, 
isolating the poison from them, since no matter where they ran, it seemed the poison dispersed in large quantities like a gas, covering the temple in a sort of cloud. Fortunately, this little trick wouldn't be enough to kill them. Hmm. Let's wait for the gas to disperse. Agreeing, both Yono and Tsubaki stopped, waiting for Yuki. No matter when the poison was used, it was destined to disappear with the wind, so they weren't worried. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. An energy sphere headed towards their location at high speed. Seeing this, Yuno took Tsubaki by the nape and dodged with a jump. Ugh. B-O-M-M. Creating a strong explosion, the debris was absorbed by space and swallowed into the void. Seeing this made Yuno clench her teeth. If they had been a bit slower, that attack would have hit them, spelling the end for both. Fortunately, the barrier didn't disappear, otherwise, they would be in danger due to the lingering poison in the air. Cough, cough. Grasping her throat in pain, Tsubaki couldn't help but cough. Yuno had grabbed her suddenly and without warning, causing her to choke. However, when she was about to complain, her eyes widened at the large crater where they had stood before. Seeing this sent a shiver down her spine, and at the same time, she couldn't help but give Yuno a second look. Due to her, they were still alive. Thanks, Gaze-san. Don't thank me. The enemy is up there. Ha ha ha, well, well. So, this is where you hide, huh? As if responding to her words, a voice echoed from the sky. Crossing her arms, Minin smiled cruelly, looking down. A barrier protected her body, just like Tsubaki's, preventing the poisonous gas from affecting her. Seeing Minin, Yuno, and Tsubaki couldn't help but feel uneasy, a dangerous enemy had appeared. A second at. We meet again. Where's the other brat is he hiding or did he abandon you ha ha ha. After a bit of the poisonous gas dispersed, Minin could see the two figures she had attacked. Seeing Yuno, she couldn't help but be surprised. For Minin, Yuno was her last enemy. With the aura she carried and her abilities, Yuno was the real deal. Chapter 290, He is Mine. However, what Minin fears the most is the other child. The key. If Minin is not mistaken, that child is more powerful and troublesome than any other participant. It is for that child that Minin chose to hunt others, and only when her power is sufficient will she face Yuno. Yet, here was Yuno, teaming up with Sexta. She must admit that this surprised her. But it's also a good thing because without the key around, she has nothing to fear. Yuki would never abandon me. He will be here very soon. I understand. Since that's the case. We have very little time. I'll make you regret leaving his side. Don't worry, when you die, I'll take care of him. Smiling at Yuno's words, several black spheres flew around Manin. At the same time, Yuno unsheathed her katana. Try if you can. I will protect Yuki. I won't let a fox like you lay a finger on him. He is mine. Every dragon has an inverse scale that, when touched or threatened, only dooms those who challenge it. And for Yuno, Yuki is her inverse scale. From the moment Minin mentioned Yuki, a deep rage surged from within Yuno, crawling like thousands of ants on her body. And when Minin mentioned taking care of him, that rage exploded. Yuno could no longer control herself. It was the last straw. The mere thought of seeing Yuki in the arms of another woman drove her mad. Her precious love, the one who knew her better than she knew herself, the person willing to be called and stay with her for eternity. So, without hesitation, she separated from Tsubaki, creating a barrier around her. Her expression twisted. I'll make that dirty smile disappear from your face. Shua. Eh. Die. As Minin's body disappeared instantly, she opened her eyes in surprise. But before she could speak, Yuno had already appeared behind her, bringing down her katana mercilessly. Seeing this, Minin was unable to dodge, so she had no choice but to use her arm as a shield, avoiding a fatal blow. Yuno. Blood flowed, and Minin's arm separated. This attack took her by surprise. In her wildest dreams, she never thought Yuno would attack her so suddenly. After all, Yuno is a 14-year-old high school student. Someone like her, with barely any experience in killing, 
would hesitate when faced with the prospect of taking a life. But she was wrong. You know never hesitated. For her, Mining is someone who must die for the sake of her happiness. Ha! Huh. But Yuno wasn't done. She raised her katana again, wanting to strike once more. However, by then, Mining's body froze, and she disappeared, leaving only residual images. She had accelerated time. You little brat! Clenching her teeth, Mining did her best to suppress the pain. However, the blood kept flowing. Seeing this, Mining's eyes narrowed. She had come close to death. She had no doubt that if she hadn't used her arm to deflect that katana, her head would now be separated from her body. A clean blow to kill. I let my guard down. I was overconfident, being injured was the result of her negligence. Power creates proud and arrogant individuals. Mining, for instance, after killing Octava, thought she was superior to other participants, and she was right. Her energy level was higher than all the other participants. However, when it comes to talent and skill, she was still below Yuno by a wide margin. Yuno was, after all, someone with great combat skills. Furthermore, Yuno is the participant with the most kills. Both 11th and 12th fell by her hand. And even though she had Yuki's help, in the end, in this survival game, Yuki himself was her greatest power. Calm down. I won't let myself be surprised again. Adjusting her breathing, Mining's body shone, and the severed arm, along with the lost blood, returned to her body as if nothing had happened. She had reversed time, healing her wounds, or rather, changing her body with the me from a few minutes ago. Seeing this, Yuno frowned. She had managed to catch Mining off guard, using instant teleportation and attempting to kill her in one blow, without giving her a chance for retaliation. However, Mining's reflexes were terrifying, as was her tenacity. Without hesitation, she was willing to lose an arm rather than her life. This told a lot about her character. She is a survivor who will do whatever it takes to survive. You got lucky, brat. You won't have it again. Come on, bitch. This is just the beginning. Teleporting again, Yuno disappeared. However, this time, Mining also disappeared. After all, she wasn't the only one using teleportation. The spheres around her also exploded. Bam. Dash dash. Incredible. On the other hand, Tsubaki was surprised that Yuno had no fear of facing Novina. Both knew that Mining was on a power scale entirely different from theirs, controlling two attributes time and space making her dangerous. That Yuno could cut off Mining's arm made Tsubaki's jaw drop in shock. Yuno is strong and loses control when it comes to Yuki. This fact made Tsubaki inwardly sigh with relief. She was glad she hadn't seduced Yuki before, otherwise, her head might have rolled. Good morning, Sexta Oni-chan. Shall we go? However, she was so absorbed in watching the mining and Yuno battle in the sky that she completely forgot about the other enemy. As she saw the boy in green overalls and a gas mask emerging from the poisonous smoke cloud, the barrier around her body strengthened, and her expression sank. She ee. Thanks to that, she managed to evade the boy's attack. However, it wasn't over, as the surroundings distorted, revealing hundreds of mirrors. Let's play, Oni-chan. With a playful smile, the boy clapped, and at the same time, the mirrors around him began to tremble. I'm sure you'll like this game, Oni-chan. Emerging from the shadows, Yuki frowned. Novina appeared earlier than expected. Based on her location, she should have taken about 15 minutes to discover this place and another 10 minutes to travel. Enough time for him to kill Decimo, defeat Quinto, and, as he planned after killing Decimo, lurk in the shadows, waiting for the opportune moment to intervene. And surveying the battlefield, with Yuno facing Manin and Sabeki trapped in Rajik's time castle, Yuki clenched his fist ready to enter the time castle and rescue Tsubaki. After all, unlike Yuno, she is the one with the dead end, and her chances of dying are the highest. However, where are you going, Ani-chan? A voice interrupted his thoughts. Quinto. Stepping out of the smoke, a boy in overalls and a gas mask tilted his head, blinking. Yuki, of course, knew about this boy and was surprised. 
After all, this boy was supposed to be in the time castle with Xabaki. Contrary to his thoughts, Rajak was now in front of him. A clone no, this is different. With his sherry non-spinning, Yuki quickly tried to analyze the origin of this anomaly and a way to counter it. However, Rajak had other plans. Ani I Chan, do you want to play with me come on, let's play. Chapter 291, Hide and Seek. Do you want to play with me? Narrowing his eyes beneath his mask, Rajak said, meeting Yuki for the first time. The key, as well as the reason you know has killed three participants so far. Rajak's first impression of Yuki is that he is a cute kid cosplaying. He certainly doesn't he look like a deadly weapon, yet the fact that he is so calm in the poisonous cloud without needing a barrier or gas mask is more than enough to put Rajak on the defensive. Moreover, those heterochromatic eyes made him tremble in a way, so he did his best to avert his gaze and look directly at Yuki's feet. Doing so made his body feel slightly better, and his thoughts became clearer. Yuki, of course, wasn't he wearing a gas mask and even ignored the poisonous cloud. After all, the apocalypse virus in his blood destroyed any harmful substance to his body, making him immune to poison. Unless it was a substance superior to the apocalypse virus, it was useless for poison to harm his body. I do like to play. But I don't think your games are that enjoyable. From the information Raziel had provided and the warning from Decimo, Yuki could get an idea of what a game meant for this child. His sherry non-spun and inspected Rajak's body. Based on the energy it emitted, it was clear he wasn't a clone or an illusion. It was his real body. However, the one with Xabaki was also real since the energy emitted was the same as the child standing in front of him. What the hell is going on? Zafkil. Tick. Talk. With no other choice, Yuki summoned his angel. After all, Zafkil is the emperor of time, someone with power similar to Rajak. With his help, Yuki could figure out what was going on. You want tea, Ani I Chan. After all, the game has already started. At the same time Zafkiel materialized, so did the surrounding area. Castle of Time. Correct, Ani I Chan. I knew you'd like it. Seeing himself trapped in what seemed to be a house of mirrors, Yuki frowned. This child had been watching him, so he quickly made countermeasures against Yuki's Sherry Nan. It seemed the child had seen him use Genjutsu on Decimo's pet. With hundreds of mirrors reflecting his image, it was clear that this kid didn't he want to be found. I see. He doesn't he want me to put him to sleep, but it's not like I wanted to do that. If Yuki had wanted to from the beginning, he could have used Genjutsu. However, his curiosity was greater. He needed to find answers to why there were two Risyukes. And although it's a castle of time, it's more like a frame of time, very similar to when he uses Tokihami no Shiro, which is why Yuki recognized it instantly. So. What now trapping me in this castle won't he help you at all? You can't beat me, but I suppose you already knew that. Of course, Ani Ichan is very strong. Defeating Ani Ichan in a direct fight is a definite no, but we can play, right what do you say, Ani Ichan? Clapping his hands, Rajik's mood didn't he change at all quite the opposite. He knew facing Yuki head-on was a mistake, Decimo was proof of that. In fact, Decimo was Rajik's guinea pig. So he chose another path. All right. Let S play. That S great. The rules are simple, Ani I Chan. Every mirror in this castle contains a fragment of an alternate timeline. If Ani I Chan can gather all the fragments before Ani I Chan's time runs out, he wins. But be careful, Ani I Chan, there will be surprises. Let the game begin. Raising his hand, the castle of time trembled, and a large digital clock materialized. Seeing the digital clock, Yuki couldn't he help but smile. You're consuming my time, ha ha ha, how fun, let us see what surprises you've got in store for me. Indeed, from the moment the castle trembled, his vitality was being drained, and that's why he knew his time was running out. Using the enemy's vitality to fuel one's own ability is a privilege only those with the power of time possess. But this was also Rajik's mistake, as the only one who drains vitality here is Yuki. Zafkiel is selfish after all, and doesn't he like to share unless it's with another Zafkiel, like with Kurumi. 
It doesn't he matter. Let S play. I am also curious about those fragments. Shaking his head, Yuki decided to play along, so he walked towards the first mirror. By finding these fragments, maybe he could solve the mystery of there being two Risyukes. Underscore 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 run. Welcome to my game castle, Oni Chen. Smiling, Rajak removed his gas mask, and hundreds of mirrors projected his image. This isnt good. On the other hand, Tsubaki had cold sweat running down her face. This scenario wasn't he part of the plan. She never thought the enemy would attack at the same time as Yuno and Minin were fighting. He must know that creating such a castle tends to attract attention, especially from those two in the sky who were fighting and teleporting. Looking around, Tsubaki frowned. There were only mirrors. Seeing this, her aura began to rise, and the barrier around her strengthened. Although she didn't he know exactly what was happening, she knew one thing. She had to survive. The enemy is a child, but even if he is a child, that doesn't he mean he isnt dangerous. So Tsubaki could only grit her teeth and fight. Haha, <laughs> don't be so nervous, Oni-chan. Like I said, we're going to play. Rajak clapped as he saw Tsubaki grit her teeth, trying to lighten the mood. Play don't joke with me. You want to kill me, you're my enemy. Clicking her tongue, Tsubaki said no more. A small sphere formed in her hand. If she couldn't escape peacefully, she would blow up these damn mirrors. However, as soon as the sphere formed, it was destroyed into thousands of particles. Opening her mouth in shock, Tsubaki couldn't believe it. Her energy was being devoured, and upon realizing this, her expression darkened. That s why I said not to be so nervous, Oni-chan, there are many things Oni-chan has ignored, so you should follow the rules and play, right Oni-chan. Narrowing his eyes, Rajik's smile widened as he looked directly at Tsubaki's shadow, urging the one hiding to come out. We'll play. Following Rajik's words, Tsubaki's shadow fluctuated, and at the same time, Yuki clone emerged from it, completely surprising Tsubaki, who was in absolute terror at such an unnatural sight. That's what I expected from Ani Ai Chan. A complete elite, keeping calm and following instructions. Although I'm surprised you detected me. Of course, I'm very good at hide and seek. Wait. That's a great idea. I know what we'll play. As if something lit up in Rajik's mind, he clapped and smiled at the same time. We'll play hide and seek. Since I found Ani Ai Chan. Now it's your turn to find me. While Tsubaki had no idea what was happening, that didn't he mean Yuki clone didn't he? Since hiding in Tsubaki's shadow, he sensed something strange in this castle. I hope the original finishes quickly. From how things were going, this was beyond what a clone like him could handle. Oni Ai Chan and Oni Chan. Your task is to find me. To make it fairer, I'll give you a hint. I'm hiding in one of these mirrors, but you must find me quickly, or your time will run out. Let us go. The game begins. Find me quickly, Oni Ai Chan, Oni Chan. Haha. <laughs> As Rajak finished speaking, the images in the mirrors began to disappear one by one, and the mirrors started moving and changing places. This isnt fair. Seeing this, Yuki clone couldn't he help but show a bitter smile. After all, each mirror was identical. One mistake, and they ran the risk of entering the same mirror over and over again. It was undoubtedly an unfair game. But life is unfair. Chapter 292, Senin Mode Yuki-kun. How is it? Don't be too surprised, I'm just fulfilling my part of the deal. Remember I said I'd protect you. Shaking her head, Yuki clone sighed. Tsubaki could never detect the Yuki clone hiding in her shadow, revealing how little she understood about her powers. However, it hadn't even been 24 hours since she received her powers, so it wasn't surprising if she couldn't use them perfectly. The real issue was Rajik. Unlike Tsubaki, he was using his powers with precision and utility, exploiting his enemy's vitality instead of using his own. For a five-year-old to think this strategically was terrifying, 
Rajak was proving to be the most problematic opponent they had encountered. I understand. And thank you, Yuki-kun. Honestly, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't know what to do in this situation. Bowing slightly, Tsubaki could finally breathe easy. Since parting ways with Yuki, she had been on edge with her unstable bodyguard Yuno and enemies seeking her life. Only Yuki made her feel secure his aura and power were more than enough. While not fully trusting Yuki, she knew he wouldn't betray her to the enemy, which would only empower them. As for killing her himself, if Yuki wanted that, he could have done it long ago. There was no need to bother now. Don't worry. Yuki, on the other hand, casually waved his hand and analyzed the mirrors in front of him the key to their escape. Any idea how to get out of this place energy attacks don't seem to work here. You're right, energy attacks won't work. Our energy is consumed every second, using them would be wasting valuable power. What do we do, Yuki-kun do we enter a mirror as Quinto suggested? We have to, but not blindly. There are many variables to consider, and we have limited time. With hundreds of mirrors moving around, blindly choosing one was not an option. Tsubaki thought it was futile, there were just too many mirrors to choose from. After calculating our time, we have an opportunity to enter a mirror and find Rajak in the fragment. Beyond that, our time will end, and it'll be game over. Yuki clone credited Rajak for this interesting use of his powers. While he didn't know what the original was doing, he had no hope that the original would solve this problem. Everything rested in their hands, and Tsubaki's death here would only make Rajak even more dangerous. I understand, so. Which one do we choose? With hundreds of mirrors flying around and changing positions, Tsubaki's head was pounding. Finding the right mirror in this situation was nearly impossible, and the worst part was they only had one chance if they chose the wrong one, everything would end. Let me try something. Finding Rajak among hundreds of mirrors was a problem. The Sherry Non wouldn't detect his energy through the fragments, and even the Byakugan, the best eye for sensing energy, wouldn't be useful. His sensory jutsu wouldn't find Rajak hiding in this time frame. Raziel's information tended to be inaccurate when it involved time. So, he had only one option. I don't like using it. But I have no other choice. With a slight hand gesture, Yuki clone activated his jutsu, and the rhombus mark on his forehead expanded like a tattoo. Ninpo, Suzu Saisei. As a time clone, Yuki clone had access to this jutsu, representing his past. Unlike Shadow and Ice clones, Yuki's clones were different, and this was one of their strengths. His seal was peculiar, storing four types of energy, chakra, spiritual energy, life force, and senjutsu chakra. For Yuki, always having chakra was essential. Even though Zafkiel could store chakra, Yuki believed having two places to store his energy was a priority. Luckily, he followed his judgment, and now, after two years of accumulating spiritual energy and chakra, he could use this jutsu. However, accumulating three types of energy took a lot of time and effort. Only after absorbing all the power of the apocalypse virus in Inori's world did his seal form and mutate. The release of the seal summoned a horned spiritual serpent that crawled over his body, enhancing his chakra flow and creating a protective bubble. At the same time, his white skin cracked, revealing serpent-like scales around him. The apocalypse virus reacted, providing him with a crystal armor, boosting his defense in his astral suit. His eyes changed, adding snake-like corneas and crimson marks around each eye. His hair grew a few centimeters darker. Senin mode. Due to his physical transformation, it would be more accurate to say his sage mode was incomplete and more of a sage transformation. However, despite disliking it, his abilities received a significant boost, along with all his statistics. His. Hick. With the serpent crawling over Yuki's clone body, Tsubaki screamed in terror. This abrupt transformation surprised her greatly, but more than fear, she was fascinated by it. The horned spiritual serpent had its charm unlike real snakes, it was made of natural energy. The same applied to Yuki. He was already a cute child, but in this transformation, his aura and charm transformed. If before he radiated innocence and purity, now he exuded a bad boy charm, complemented by his astral suit and physical appearance very similar to a delinquent kid. Each had its charm, appealing to different women based on taste. 
Tsubaki was no exception, her eyes couldn't help but shine when she saw him. Gaze-san, you have good taste. I love it. For Tsubaki, Yuki was the embodiment of Yuno's deepest desires, so she could sympathize with her and praised her for having good taste. An innocent child who could also become a bad boy was a terrible combination for a woman's desires. Come on, I don't have much time. Yuki, on the other hand, closed his eyes. He didn't have much time in this transformation. Gathering Senjutsu Chakra was challenging, and due to this time frame, Yuki clone couldn't access the natural energy of the world. He could only rely on the Senjutsu Chakra sealed on his forehead. In this state, all of Yuki's ninjutsus and extrasensory jutsus drastically increased. Sage mode provided an incredible perception of energy and the presence of others. In this state, Yuki's consciousness could sense and see beyond what the Sherry non could, even predicting movements more clearly. And in this state, combined with his sensory jutsus, I found you. As predicted, finding Rajik wasn't a problem. Chapter 293, Fragment of Time Opening his eyes abruptly, Yuki moved swiftly, lifting Tsubaki in his arms like a princess. Tsubaki, still staring at him, was understandably surprised. Being embraced so suddenly confused her, and moving at high speed was a new experience. Her long hair fluttered in the wind, and the snake coiled around her, providing protection against the wind. SSSSSSHHH. Gulp. More than just confused, feeling the snake move across her body sent shivers down Tsubaki's spine. At the same time, she swallowed nervously and couldn't help but cling tighter to Yuki. What's happening? Please stop. I've found fifth. We don't have much time, we need to enter the mirror now. With this brief explanation, Yuki didn't bother speaking further and continued running at high speed. Surely, Rajik must have noticed Yuki's abnormality and the need to prevent him from entering the mirror. To avoid that, Yuki clone maneuvered quickly, avoiding accidentally entering one of those mirrors. He also made sure to keep his awareness on Rajik's energy, preventing him from escaping to another mirror. Kaaaaaa. With Tsubaki's scream, Yuki increased his speed even more. He executed an inverted jump, successfully avoiding a mirror that appeared in front of him, preventing entry. I've got you. Without giving him a chance to escape, Yuki kicked the air, successfully entering the mirror where Rajik was hiding. Dash dash. Ani Ai Chan, you're very strong. Finding me so quickly shows that you're an elite. Opening his eyes in surprise, Rajik observed Yuki's astonishing transformation and the speed at which he found him. Rajik knew that for Yuki to achieve this, he had to analyze the entire fragment of time. The energy and power required were immense, especially in this castle where he absorbed the energy of his enemies, weakening them significantly. However, Yuki managed to do it, showcasing his strength and danger. Rajik, avoiding a direct confrontation, used tenth as bait. But if you think that's enough to find me, Ani Ai Chen, I'll have to disappoint you. Shaking his head, a smile formed on Rajik's face. Even if they entered the correct mirror, finding him wouldn't be so easy. Yes, Rajik Chan is very strong too. You're an elite, you won't lose. Imitating a woman's voice, the puppet in Yuki's right hand spoke, followed by the left puppet mimicking a man's voice. Hum. Hum. Come on, Rajik Khan, you mustn't let your guard down. The key has killed two participants. That's why Yuki was so dangerous. If he wanted to kill Yuno, he had to neutralize the key first. You're right. Following the advice of his puppets, Rajik opened his diary of drawings once again. I apologize for disappointing you, but you'll never find me. I hope you enjoy my surprise, Ani Ai Chan, Oni Chan. Muttering these words, Rajik closed his eyes, and at the same time, the fragment of time activated. Dash dash. Huh. Opening her eyes, Tsubaki found herself lying on a familiar futon. How strange. Murmuring, she rubbed her eyes, trying to process the information. For some reason, she felt like she was missing something, but her instincts were confused. As if everything were a dream. But looking at this familiar room again, it didn't seem like a dream. In her confusion, she didn't notice that a woman had entered her room. Well. You've woken up, 
Tsubaki Chan. Mother. Upon hearing a familiar voice, Tsubaki turned her head, also seeing a blurry but familiar silhouette. Due to her poor vision from birth, her limited sight only allowed her to see up to the hands. However, even with that, Tsubaki was too familiar with the silhouette to mistake it for anyone else. After all, this was her mother. Mother. Seeing this familiar silhouette, Tsubaki's emotions exploded. Her eyes teared up, and she couldn't help but throw herself into her mother's arms. She didn't know why she couldn't control her emotions, but she felt that if she didn't hug her mother, she would regret it. Tsubaki Chan, what's wrong? Her mother, of course, was surprised. Her daughter was acting strangely, hugging her suddenly, burying her face in her chest, and crying. It was very unusual, so she asked directly. But this behavior was something even Tsubaki couldn't explain, she simply couldn't control herself. After a while, they separated, with her mother consoling and patting her head. Tsubaki's emotions calmed down, but she still felt reluctant to let go. It's okay, Tsubaki-chan. Let me prepare breakfast. I I'll help. He he he, lovely Tsubaki-chan helping me I'm sure dad will be pleased. Putting a hand to her lips, Tsubaki's mother laughed, seeing her little daughter grow up. After preparing breakfast, the warm family began to eat with smiles on their faces. Dear what do you think of the food? Food is it good? Unable to comprehend his wife's question, Tsubaki's father tilted his head, while the woman smiled in response. Of course, it's good. Tsubaki-chan made it, after all. Tsubaki. Opening his eyes in disbelief, the man turned his head, looking at his daughter with surprise as she lowered her head, her cheeks blushing. Since seeing her father, Tsubaki, like with her mother, had also hugged him tightly. She didn't know why all of this was happening, but for some reason, seeing them made her very happy. That's why she cooked breakfast as an expression of affection for her parents. She had been nervous watching her father eat without saying a word. She didn't dare to ask, and even though she wanted to know if her food was good, she was too embarrassed to ask. Fortunately, her mother saw through her, helping her in that regard. When her father found out who cooked, he was surprised. Her 12-year-old daughter, with poor vision and being a spoiled child, had never cooked before. The fact that her food fell within an acceptable range for the first time left him stunned. But more than stunned, he also considered a possibility. If his daughter took the initiative to cook, it meant only one thing. My daughter is growing up. Soon she'll exchange her father for a man. Indeed, as she resembled her mother more and her feminine power grew, it would attract the attention of many boys. If Tsubaki liked one of them, it explained her performance in the kitchen. He just wanted his daughter to test it on him first before cooking for her boyfriend. Shaking his head, Tsubaki's father felt a bit sad. This was the cycle of life, one day, his daughter would leave his side. Fortunately, his mood didn't last long, as it was a special day. Guinea pig or not, his daughter cooked for him. He was the first to taste her food, so with a big smile on his face, he ate quickly. It's delicious. Thank you. Era era. With her father praising her, Tsubaki blushed, muttering so softly that her voice resembled the sound of a mosquito. Seeing this, her mother couldn't help but tease her daughter a bit. With this heartwarming family time, breakfast had come to an end. Dash dash. Why do I feel like I'm forgetting something? Two days had passed since Tsubaki woke up, and the sensation she had since that morning had not faded. On the contrary, the anxiety within her grew stronger, as if something bad was about to happen. No matter, it can't be important if I've forgotten it. Shaking her head, Tsubaki decided to take a bath to clear her mind. Another great day. Walking through the temple garden, Tsubaki saw various silhouettes passing by, greeting her. The Omekata sect was becoming more popular. At this rate, her sect would become one of the most prosperous in Japan. With many members contributing, the facilities were getting better, and even the garden was adorned with numerous flowers. Although she couldn't see it directly, the sweet scent of the flowers was more than enough to lift Sabeki's mood. Chapter 294, Accident Huh? Wow. Wow. However, before reaching the bathroom, 
A small silhouette approached Subaki. It was a cute little black dog. Little one. Are you lost? Although she couldn't see it directly, its barks made it obvious that it was a dog. With a smile on her face, Subaki bent down to get a better look at the puppy. While it was unusual to see dogs in the temple, having pets was a pleasant sight. Subaki wasn't sure if it was a stray that managed to get in, but the puppy had a collar, indicating it had an owner. So, it was safe to assume the puppy was lost. How adorable! As she got closer, Subaki's eyes lit up. The puppy was even cuter than expected, and her eyes couldn't help but sparkle as she reached out to pet it. Woof! Woof! Feeling Subaki's touch, the puppy squinted its eyes and barked. Ha what do we have here? After petting the puppy for a few seconds, Subaki felt something unusual on its collar. A letter. Indeed, on the puppy's collar was a piece of paper. Intrigued, Subaki took it, and as she did, the puppy fled, leaving Subaki puzzled. What's happening? For some reason, her heart began to pound when she held the letter. Unable to curb her curiosity, Subaki read it. Miss Subaki, your parents will die tonight. With just that message, Subaki's eyes widened, and a terrible foreboding took hold of her. Subaki couldn't control her emotions, her head ached, and her anxiety increased. Something bad was about to happen. After adjusting her breathing and calming down a bit, she continued reading the letter. Even though she didn't know who wrote it and why it was given to her, she fully believed in the message. It might be instinct or just fear, but she took this message seriously. She couldn't risk her parents' lives, and her anxiety only heightened with this letter. An accident a trap. After carefully reading the rest of the message, the letter emitted a faint glow, and something clicked in her head. However, she couldn't remember, as if something were blocking her memories. Subaki didn't know what all this meant, but what she did know was that she needed to act. So, without wasting time, she ran to find her parents. Time was running out, night was falling, and from what she heard this afternoon, her parents were about to leave. She needed to stop them. Everything ready? Yes, dear. Assenting to his wife's words, Subaki's father got into the car. This afternoon, they had an important matter to attend to. As their sect, Omikata, gained popularity, people outside Sakurami City now visited their temple. Every week they needed logistical assistance, and as their sect grew, they lacked support staff. So, they temporarily took on this role. Dad. Mom. But when they were ready to start the car and leave, they saw their daughter running. Seeing their agitated daughter, both of them stepped out of the car, completely confused. What's happening, Tsubaki Chen? You can't leave, something bad. Something bad is definitely going to happen. Due to the fatigue and anxiety displayed on their daughter's face, both mother and father couldn't help but look at each other. Trying to calm their daughter, things got complicated. This small scene was getting bigger. After all, Tsubaki is the Maiko of this temple, seeing her crying and almost shouting at her parents was something they hadn't witnessed. People began to gather more and more, making the family uncomfortable. So, they shook their heads and went back into the temple. Tsubaki Chen. Let's talk. Tell me what's going on. Once they were alone, the couple decided to listen to their daughter, who revealed her concerns without hesitation. Hearing her reasons, both parents couldn't help but smile bitterly. Because of the events and how they unfolded, it was as if their daughter was predicting their death. However, this is the Omekata clan. Their daughter is a seer who receives guidance from the gods. But it's all lies. Both of them knew their daughter didn't have such powers. It was a deception they used to attract people, make money, and, at the same time, provide a place for their daughter. Nevertheless, they loved their daughter and did what she said. After all, it cost nothing to take a look at their vehicle. Eyes. Is this. After an inspection, they found something incredible. A bomb. This changed everything. With this in the car, it was certain that both would be dead, and even their death could be justified as an accident, just as their daughter had said. So, they couldn't help but look at their daughter again. Who smiled. Arrest Funetsu immediately. They couldn't doubt anymore. 
This opened their eyes, perhaps their daughter, after so many years, was indeed connected to God, and this was the guidance that God gave to their daughter. Thinking about this, their eyes couldn't help but tear up. They owed their lives to their daughter, so after ordering their people, both embraced their daughter. Their daughter, a fake seer, performed an amazing miracle. With the loving family embracing each other, they didn't notice that a small black furred dog was watching them from a distance. Tsubaki Chan, it's time. You should go to school. Yes, mom. Two years had passed since the incident with her parents. That day, after discovering the bomb, they arrested the culprit and called the police. Due to a lack of evidence, a thorough investigation was conducted, but it didn't last long. Unexpectedly, Funetsu, the bomb culprit, confessed to his crimes. This surprised the family, especially Tsubaki, as she knew there was no evidence. Yet, that man confessed, so she couldn't help but think again about that cute puppy and the letter. Since that day, her parents adored her more than ever, fulfilling many of her whims and wishes. Gradually becoming a spoiled girl. Two years had passed in an instant, and her immature body was slowly turning into that of a woman. Consequently, her beauty shone, revealing more of her prominent curves that she often hid in her priestess attire. She was barely 14, but she was one of the beauties of her school. All right. Another great day. After fixing her hair, Tsubaki turned and looked in the mirror. As always, she smiled proudly at her beauty. Woof. Again, poke it. But as she was about to leave, she saw the cute black dog with a letter in its mouth. Honestly, Tsubaki didn't know how to feel about this dog. Since the day she prevented her parents' death, she fervently searched for the puppy. After all, thanks to it, her parents were still alive. She was willing to adopt it as her pet, even if it had an owner. She would find that person and express her gratitude, as it is certain that the owner of the dog must have been the one who warned Tsubaki. However, she couldn't find it. This disappointed her, no matter how much she searched, the puppy didn't return. Not until a year later, the puppy appeared before Tsubaki again. However, it had grown, and it carried a new letter in its collar. Miss Tsubaki, please remember, our time is running out. The message was different from the one she had read a year ago, but Tsubaki had great faith in this message. Since this letter saved her parents' lives, she had confidence in it. Yet, she didn't know what she had forgotten or what its purpose was. Her head simply ached, and she was unable to recall. Since then, the dog stayed by her side, appearing in her room every day with a letter in its mouth. Miss Tsubaki, please remember, our time is running out. It was the same message. For a whole year, this message was what Tsubaki greeted every morning, and to be honest, she was getting tired of it. Her head hurt every time she touched the letter, and she still couldn't remember. First of all, what was she supposed to remember she didn't know? Chapter 295, Bad Luck and the Guardian Dog Hey, hey, hey. Reclined at her desk, Tsubaki sighed with regret. She couldn't get the image of the black dog out of her mind. That little one had been with her for a whole year. Whenever something bad happened or some accident occurred, that little dog was always by her side. Each time, it pulled her out of danger. Ever since it saved her parents, her daily life had been plagued by bad luck, experiencing various accidents at first minor ones like falls and bruises. However, her accidents worsened a year later, precisely when the black dog reappeared in her life. Her mishaps became more severe, some endangering her life. That's why her room, as well as her house, underwent significant changes to enhance safety. Yet, that black dog had saved her from being hit by a car and even from potentially fatal falls. That black dog was her protector. This was also why she still attended school. For some reason, the school seemed to be the safest place. Since she entered the school, there had been no accidents. This fact had been verified many times. So, Tsubaki relaxed, this school was her sacred place. And she gradually learned to live with this bad luck. What's wrong, Tsubaki-san you look more troubled than usual. Seeing Tsubaki more downcast than usual, her two good friends approached. One had chestnut-colored hair with two long sideburns reaching her shoulders. Her skin was fair, 
and her eyes were brown. She wore a purple shirt and blue jeans, with small bandages around her face. This girl was Hinata Hino. Is it love if it is, spill the beans, Kajigano san. The other girl had light purple, very long hair, and wore a white beret. She dressed in an orange apron with two buttons on the chest, a white blouse, and a red skirt. She spoke while looking at Tsubaki with her beautiful aquamarine eyes. This girl was Mao no Nosaka. Seeing the familiar silhouettes of these two girls, a smile formed on Tsubaki's face. These two girls were the only ones who still stuck by her. Tsubaki's bad luck was well known, so many of her friends had been injured over the past year. As a result, almost everyone avoided her like a plague, making these two the only ones who didn't mind staying with her. All right, everyone, take your seats. The class is about to start. Oh I almost forgot. Due to safety concerns, I've been informed that you shouldn't stay out too late at night and should return home in groups. There's a serial killer in this area. Well, that's all. After chatting with her two friends for a few minutes, the teacher entered the classroom, starting another new period. This triggered another silent conversation among the students. They had heard about the serial killer on television, so the teacher's warning didn't surprise them. It was terrifying, especially since women were his targets. Just mentioning it sent shivers down their spines, especially as they had also heard that his victims were often dismembered and tortured. The killer was undoubtedly a madman. Serial killer. Huh. Especially for Tsubaki, she didn't know why, but her head hurt when they mentioned the killer, as if she knew him. Unfortunately for Tsubaki, she couldn't remember. I'm surprised, really. To see Poke is still coming every day. That dog is very intelligent. After class, both Mao and Hinata approached Tsubaki, who happily walked home with them. However, the duo was surprised to see a large black dog at the school entrance. In these two years, the little puppy Tsubaki had met had disappeared, replaced now by this adult dog. Every day, this dog was Tsubaki's guardian, dropping her off at school in the morning and appearing at dismissal time to accompany her home. This was the routine of this dog. This surprised Hinata a lot because even her father's dogs weren't as smart as this dog. And honestly, she was a bit envious because she had witnessed this dog save Tsubaki from danger more than once. This dog was the light, exuding a friendly aura that made it very special. If Tsubaki had bad luck, then this dog was good luck, counteracting the bad. This dog, like Tsubaki, was well known in the school, but unlike Tsubaki, the dog was very popular. Its fur was shiny, and it smelled really good, similar to a giant scented plushie. Hence, it quickly gained the affection of the girls, who petted and hugged it. Pokey is as popular as ever. Smiling with a hand on her cheek, Mao watched as a pink-haired girl caressed the dog. Pokey. Traitor. On the other hand, Tsubaki pouted. Pokey is her dog, so she couldn't help but feel jealous. This ungrateful dog always wags its tail whenever it sees a pretty girl. Jealous ha ha ha, did Pokey change his owner? Seeing Tsubaki's pout, Hinata couldn't help but laugh. After all, she understood Tsubaki, when your pet is closer to someone else than to you, it leaves you lost and empty. It's the love they have for their pets. Woof. Woof. The dog called Pokey, on the other hand, wagged its tail while enjoying the pink-haired girl's caresses. Good dog. You smell nice. The girl, like the dog, also enjoyed the furry giant's coat. Just like a plushie, its fur was so soft that she couldn't help but smile. She also lamented a bit as she saw the dog's collar, symbolizing that this dog had an owner. Pokey. What a nice name. You know, my name is Yuno Gaze, let's be friends. Woof. Woof. Agreeing with a nod, the dog barked and licked the girl's cheek. Hee <laughs> hee, that's enough, enough. You're tickling me. Watching the scene of a pretty girl hugging a giant dog, the boys couldn't help but take a second look. After all, this isn't something you see every day. But to all of this, Tsubaki looked at them with cold eyes. Pokey, it's time to go. Snorting coldly, Tsubaki looked at the giant silhouette of the dog and decided to ignore it. This playful dog. How sad, your owner is calling you. Can we play together tomorrow? Woof, 
Wolf. As if understanding Yuno's words, the dog barked and licked her cheek, causing more tickles. Yuno-chan is having fun too. That's right, Pokey is popular. HMP. Trader dog. With smiles on their faces, the duo separated from Tsubaki, while the latter watched her dog continue to lick Yuno's face. Pokey. Wolf, wolf. Reluctant to part ways Yuno hugged the fluffy dog one last time before letting go. This dog was really good to her. Unfortunately, it had an owner. Even though she knew that Tsubaki's owner was famous for bad luck, this dog was famous for being a hero. Wolf, wolf. HMP. Trying to find the bright side of its owner, the dog approached. Tsubaki, snorting with coldness, looked away. However, the dog didn't give up, it stood on its hind legs, licking its owner's face. I get it already. Enough. I'll buy you some sweets on the way. As if satisfied with Tsubaki's response, the dog returned to walking on all fours. Shaking her head, Tsubaki had no choice but to pull out the leash from her bag and tie it around her pet's neck, then they headed away from the school. Another day had ended. However, what she didn't know was that a pair of eyes were watching her from a distance. And from the dangerous gleam in those eyes, the intentions were not good. Chapter 296, Message oh, This is strange. Tsubaki blinked in confusion, tilting her head. She had left school, crossed several streets, and still nothing had happened. She's well aware that her bad luck is no joke, she's been involved in absurd accidents countless times, which her dog often protects her from. However, it had been quite a while and several streets, and still, nothing had occurred. Given her unfortunate combination with vehicles due to her bad luck, she tends to walk home. Her parents even bought a house near the school for that reason since the temple was outside the city, raising the probability of accidents. But now, her bad luck seemed to have disappeared. Is it over could it be that God is smiling at me again? With these thoughts in mind, Tsubaki smiled with happiness. Her bad luck is a nightmare for her, so living a normal life is a great relief, not to mention that a Maiko like her with bad luck is a cruel joke. Meanwhile, the dog narrowed its eyes as if sensing something significant lurking in the shadows. Dash dash. Miss Sabaki, the enemy is cornered, it's dangerous, I don't like it, there's a loose assassin. Please, remember. We don't have much time, I won't be able to hold on much longer, you are the only one who can finish this. Poke. Reading the day's letter, Sabaki couldn't help but glance at her pet, who lowered its head as if pleading. This puzzled her a lot, today's message was longer than any she had seen in a year. Remember what does she need to recall what's wrong with time assassin what assassin the serial killer the police are looking for exactly. Who writes these messages? Staring intently at her pet, Tsubaki frowned. The messages in these letters had saved her many times, so she trusted them. But she also wanted to know who this person was. Who is Poka's true owner why does Poka deliver these letters what does this person expect why are the messages becoming more desperate why does her anxiety increase every time she looks at these letters Tsubaki has many questions, but unfortunately, no one can answer them. The only living being that knows about her is possibly her pet. However, from another perspective, her pet is very suspicious. It appeared out of nowhere and clung to her as a guardian. Besides school, this dog followed her most of the time even sleeping together at night. So, how does it show up with a message every morning sighing with regret, Tsubaki couldn't help but shake her head. It's a shame, but she doesn't remember anything, and she has a feeling that if she does, the life she's been leading will end. She doesn't want it to end. She may have bad luck, but she's confident that she's happy. This alone made her ignore her pet's messages. All right, that's it for today, Kajiga no San. Please come to the teacher's lounge, we need to talk. With these words, the teacher finished his class, waiting for the bell to ring, signaling the end of class. Of course, the bell didn't disappoint him, as it rang a few seconds later, marking the end of the school day. Hum. What a hectic day. Hum. Hum. I want to go home. With smiles on their faces, both Hineda and Mao couldn't help but stretch lazily. Sitting at a desk for hours would bore any normal youth, so the sound of the bell was a joy for them. 
Ugh. Sabaki, on the other hand, held her head with both hands. Unlike the rest of the class, her luck wasn't so great. After all, if she's not mistaken, the teacher calling her is about her low grades on the last exam. This spoiled girl has entered her comfort zone. So, she's quite lazy, and although she excels in subjects like math and history, the others are a complete lost cause. She couldn't help but grumble in displeasure, at this rate, she'll have to take those unpleasant summer classes. For Tsubaki, this is the worst. As a spoiled Ajusama, she had planned how she would spend her vacation, the beach, pools, or even a trip abroad. But with these grades, her plans will go down the drain. Hee hee cheer up, Tsubaki san I'm sure Hayama sensei will let you go soon. That's right, Kajigano san Don't worry, if it helps, I'll also take summer classes. Fortunately, her two good friends, Hinata and Mao, approached to console her. Huuuu. However, their consolation only served to rub more salt into the wound. Tsubaki's lost aura made both Hinata and Mao realize that their friend is a lost cause. Come on. You can do it. Looking at the door in front of her, Tsubaki clenched her teeth. At the same time, she couldn't help but look up at the ceiling, her vacation plans were in jeopardy. She needed all the help she could get. Talk, talk. Come in. Sorry to interrupt. Hayama sensei called me. Slowly opening the door, Tsubaki peeked her head inside, looking at the teachers who greeted her with bitter smiles. Hayama sensei said to wait for him. Good luck, Kajigano san. Tsubaki Kajigano, the girl with bad luck, that's how Tsubaki is seen. After all, as teachers, they've suffered a few minor accidents because of her. Fortunately for them, Hayama is her assigned teacher, which brought them a bit of relief. Thanks. Nodding, Tsubaki looked around until she found a small place to sit and wait. Tick. Tack. And so, the minutes passed, one by one, the teachers finished their work and went home. However, Hayama didn't return. This made Tsubaki furrow her brow, she wanted to go home too. The sky gradually darkened, and at this rate, she'd be returning home late. I'm sorry, Kajigano san, I think you should go back. I'll talk to Hayama sensei later. The only teacher still in the teacher's lounge spoke to her. Even for him, this was abnormal, making a student wait for so long wasn't something a responsible teacher would do. So, he thought of sending her home and talking to the irresponsible teacher tomorrow. It was almost nighttime, it wasn't good to have a student walk home alone, especially with that serial killer in the news. Thanks. Accepting the teacher's suggestion, Tsubaki stood up, ready to leave. However. Bam. Huh. The teacher's lounge door swung open suddenly, making both Tsubaki and the other teacher turn their heads. It's a shame, I was hoping you'd be alone, but I guess I'll deal with this burden before that dog starts to suspect. Entering through the door was a man wearing a black hat, a gas mask with goggles, and an explosive proof jacket, making him immune to many things. But Tsubaki didn't care about that because this man carried a large knife in his hand, and her heart started pounding when she saw his appearance. This was the serial killer from the news. Kajigano san. Run. Call the police. Although Tsubaki had mixed feelings about the man's appearance, the teacher beside her quickly stood in front of her to protect her. He didn't know why he was doing this, but something inside him activated, as if his primal instinct was to protect the girl behind him. He was scared, of course, but he didn't want anything to happen to Tsubaki. Run. Yes. I'm sorry. Snapping out of her thoughts, Tsubaki didn't hesitate to run and exit through the door. But before doing so, she couldn't help but turn her head one last time to look at the man with the gas mask. I see. You're one of those lackeys of the dog, and no matter, I'll kill you first. Hey, hey, hey. Looking down disdainfully at the man in front of him, the assassin twirled his knife, simultaneously lunging forward. Chapter 297, Protector. Ha. Ha. Running, Tsubaki's breath became irregular. She needed to escape. After leaving the teacher's lounge, she quickly grabbed her phone and called the police. Fortunately, she received an immediate response that reassured her. 
However, just as she was about to relax, footsteps echoed down the hallway. It was only now that she remembered even if she called the police, they weren't superheroes who would instantly come to her aid. She still needed to escape, otherwise, she would die. However, her vision wasn't good, and she couldn't run fast without stumbling and falling. Her eyes were weak, only able to see about two meters in front of her. As her vision gradually improved, the night descended, making the school corridors dark. Due to this, most students and teachers had returned home, leaving her defenseless against the serial killer. CLA. CLA. Hi. Hearing the footsteps getting closer, Tsubaki ran faster. Yeah. However, when she turned to look back, she didn't notice a wall in front of her, causing her to crash into it. It hurts. Falling onto her backside, Tsubaki touched her face in pain. This hit came out of nowhere, so she could only feel her forehead in pain. CLA. CLA. Nevertheless, the sounds of approaching footsteps brought her back to reality. I must run. With her mind in chaos, Tsubaki tried to run again. However, this time, she encountered a serious problem. She had reached a dead end. The wall she had collided with became her obstacle. Seeing this, Tsubaki's expression sank. Is this it I suppose you can run now? As if confirming her suspicions, the voice of the serial killer sounded again, emerging from the darkness. The game is over. There was no way out. Everything had ended. Tsubaki's heart started beating rapidly. No. Someone. Drip, drip. Watching the blood drip from his knife, several tears escaped, her fear of death. She had bad luck, and for two years, she learned to live with it. She never complained about it, after all, the price of her parents' lives was a minimal cost. But now. Is this also her bad luck she saved her family? But. Who will save her is it her destiny to die like this if so, then it's a crappy fate. After all, she was alone in that sense. Thinking about it, the tears in her eyes fell faster. Save me. Poke it. No, there was someone who accompanied her in her bad luck, someone who stayed by her side for a year. Her protector. He will come. Her dog will come again, as he always has. Looking at the imposing figure of her pet, a smile formed on Tsubaki's face. Are you done crying then die? However, the serial killer didn't care about any of that. He had to kill her. It was his mission, so he spun his knife and walked toward his cornered victim, who screamed, calling for her protector. Pokie Ine. Huh. On the other hand, the killer tilted his head, not understanding the point of shouting. He was on the second floor, in an isolated area, with all students and teachers gone. There was no one to rush to her rescue. Or so he thought. Woof. Woof. In response to her owner's call, a huge dog emerged from the darkness, barking and growling. This damn dog. Seeing this dog, the killer's expression sank. His greatest threat had arrived. A few minutes ago at the school entrance. Growling in boredom, the black dog waited until its owner came out. It had been waiting at the school gates, and as per its routine, the dog started wagging its tail when it heard the bell, and the students came out. However, Minutes passed, and its owner still didn't show up. This greatly bothered the huge dog. Woof. Woof. Until it saw two familiar figures, the dog didn't hesitate to approach. Oh Poke, you're such a good dog. Poke come here. Hineda and Mao, who were chatting casually, were quickly interrupted by the barking of the huge dog. As Tsubaki's friends, they weren't surprised, this dog takes care of Tsubaki every day. Smells nice Kajigano-san really loves you. Feeling the softness of its fur and its pleasant scent, Mouse quinted her eyes with happiness. What's Tsubaki-san's secret every time I see Poke, his fur seems to shine. Having dogs at home, Hinaten knows how challenging it is for a dog to keep its fur clean and pleasant. However, this dog is always clean. She wonders just how much Tsubaki loves this dog for it to be so well-fed and cared for. This, in turn, created a misunderstanding between Mao and Hineda. They could see that Tsubaki loved this dog very much. Woof. Woof. However, 
The dog ignored all of this and barked, making paw signals. The duo raised their eyebrows. Oh. I understand. Are you looking for Tsubaki-san? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but Tsubaki-san was called by a teacher. She'll be out in a moment. Hinata do you think Pokey understands what you're saying? Looking at Hinata with doubt, Mao couldn't help but shake her head. No matter how intelligent a dog is, it won't understand the complex words of a human. She also wondered if her friend was okay in the head for talking to a dog. Woof. Woof. Does he understand? But as if understanding her words, the dog barked and nodded, looking toward the school building. This sent Mao's thoughts into a whirlwind of complicated emotions. She now thought she might be crazy for witnessing this. Putting that aside, the duo played with the dog a few more minutes before heading home. Again, the dog was left waiting. But as time passed, the dog couldn't help but worry. Its owner was taking so long that the sun was setting. Are you alone? Just as it was about to enter the school and search for its owner, another voice spoke to it. Turning its head, the dog looked at a familiar figure. Woof. Woof. He he he, you're so cute. You know, who was also heading home, looked at the huge dog and decided to play. After all, this dog was as fluffy as a teddy bear. Why are you alone? Woof. Woof. Hmm. Waiting for your owner, huh? Woof. Woof. As if understanding every bark of the dog, Yuno smiled and stroked the huge dog while responding to all its reproachful barks. If anyone else saw this scene, they would surely think of this beautiful girl as an oddity and might call for the asylum. However, neither the duo nor the dog cared about that. Woof. Woof. I know, but Kajigano-san was called to the teacher's lounge. Shall we look for her together? Woof. Woof. Agreeing with Yuno's words, the duo entered the building. After all, it was what they were about to do, and with Yuno as their guide, finding this teacher's lounge would be easier. On the other hand, Yuno smiled and continued to touch the dog's fur. It's a pity. But you have an owner. Sighing with regret, Yuno shook her head. Wait, Poke. About to take matters into its own hands and search for its owner, the dog stopped when it heard Yuno's words. Woof. Woof. He he he. You're really cute. And as Yuno continued to play with the dog, they arrived at the teacher's lounge. Both couldn't help but widen their eyes. Sensei. In the teacher's lounge, there was a corpse, blood spilled everywhere, and Yuno instantly recognized the dead body. It was her math teacher. Grrrrr. On the other hand, the dog growled, and a bad feeling ran through its body. Only now did it realize that there was something strange in this building, as if it were isolated in some kind of barrier. Wait, Poke. Using its nose, the dog launched forward, trying to search for its owner's scent, while Yuno followed suit. Poke eighth. Then a woman's scream echoed throughout the building, so without hesitation, the dog put more strength into its paws, running to the rescue of its owner. Chapter 298, Remember. Damn dog. Grrrrr honestly, Hayama didn't want to encounter this dog. His mission was simple, kill Tsubaki Kajigano. Hayama tested the waters by creating accidents in which Tsubaki would be the victim. However, his mission was hindered by this enormous dog. The dog guarded Tsubaki day and night, leaving no openings for the assassin. Despite being just a dog, it was clever and dangerous. But there was a moment when the dog wasn't by Tsubaki's side, at school. Hayama thought of luring the dog and isolating everyone, students and teachers alike, as they all seemed to be under the dog's influence. His plan was well designed, even creating a barrier, but the dog entered it. This troublesome dog. Grrrrrr displaying its fangs and growling, the dog took a battle stance. Its mission was to protect Tsubaki, and it couldn't let anything happen to her. Poke. Tsubaki, seeing the huge dog responding to her call, felt her heart pound. Even in this situation, the dog was with her. All right. Let's finish this. Turning his knife, Hayama was tired of hiding in the shadows to assassinate this woman, but he had no success, all because of this annoying animal. A whole year of this silent confrontation, 
and their time was running out. GRRRRR growling in confirmation, the enormous dog lowered its body, ready to attack. Grr. Ha. Seizing an opportunity, the dog lunged forward, creating a remarkable sight. Tsubaki watched as her beloved pet skillfully avoided the assassin's attack and counteracted by charging at him. The dog's size was around 80 kilograms, and its charge was no joke. However, the assassin was not an easy target. Using his bulletproof jacket as armor, he awaited an opening to stab the dog. Yet, the dog was smarter, continuously attacking his arm with the knife, preventing retaliation. This continued for a few seconds until the dog fainted, confusing the assassin. It bit the arm holding the knife. Tlin. Tlin. Causing the knife to roll on the ground. Seeing this, Hayama widened his eyes and tried to free himself from the dog. He relied on his jacket, thinking a bite from the dog wouldn't be a big deal, and he could use his other hand to kill the annoying animal. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. The dog's bite was more lethal than he thought, easily piercing through his vest and inflicting a serious wound on his arm. Ugh. Groaning in pain, Hayama used his other hand to strike, but the enormous dog used its weight to bring the assassin down. Growling. The fight between a man and a beast. And as things stood, the beast had the upper hand. With the knife gone from Hayama's hands, the enormous dog proceeded to bite his neck, a clean kill. After all, Hayama had lost his weapon, and this was the dog's chance. Maldito animal. Using his arm to avoid the bite, a chilling shiver ran down Hayama's spine. The fangs threatening to take his life were terrifying, but as if recalling something, Hayama's eyes lowered, noticing a weapon at his waist. Using his free hand, in pain, Hayama clenched his teeth, trying to use his injured arm. Fortunately for him, the gun wasn't far, and it hadn't flown away during the fall. The enormous dog, on the other hand, focused on using its maximum strength to bite the neck and was unable to see that Hayama had taken a weapon. Die. Bang. Bang. Huwubu. Slowly raising the gun, Hayama didn't hesitate to fire twice. Due to their proximity, Hayama didn't need accuracy, just to lift the gun and pull the trigger. Even though two shots weren't enough to kill the animal, fortunately, after a few minutes, the dog's body weakened significantly, and the pressure on Hayama decreased. The enormous dog trembled, stepped back, and fell. Five shots, that's the maximum his huge body could endure. Poke. Seeing her wounded pet fall, Tsubaki couldn't help but scream and run to her friend. Tears welled up in her eyes. Her friend, who had been with her for a whole year, had fallen, her beloved pet. Thinking about the happy moments they shared, the fun games and baths, how she took care of his fur and brushed it every day to keep it shining, her best friend. Witnessing this was a hard blow for her. Although her vision was poor, she wouldn't mistake that huge silhouette for anyone else. So, anger and pain emerged from the depths of her being. She also felt helpless and guilty. If only she had a bit more courage, she could have stopped the assassin if she had worked together with her pet. However, all she could do was watch her pet get hurt. Now. It's your turn. Slowly getting up, using both hands, Hayama held the gun, pointing it at Tsubaki. His arms were seriously injured from the dog's bite, and without the bulletproof vest, he might not be able to lift them now. Taking advantage of this moment while his body was filled with adrenaline, he aimed at Tsubaki to kill her. He wanted to end this as quickly as possible. Tsubaki, on the other hand, didn't look at the gun or the assassin. Her eyes were focused on her injured pet. Goodbye. Ugh. And just as he was about to pull the trigger, a knife pierced his throat, preventing Tsubaki's tragic fate. How dare you? How dare you unforgivable? Die, you damned bastard. This knife belonged to Yuno, who stabbed him in the back without hesitation. She saw this bastard heartlessly shoot her friend. The huge dog lay in a pool of blood, so with deep pain, she picked up the knife from the ground and stabbed Hayama. Like a puppet whose strings were cut, Hayama's body also fell to the ground. But none of that mattered to the two girls as both concentrated on the wounded dog. Poke, hold on. You can't leave me, do you hear you can't leave me? Seeing her friend breathing heavily and losing blood every second, 
Tsubaki's emotions spiraled out of control. As for Yuno, she lowered her head, and shadows covered her face. Due to the injuries and time, she knew there was nothing she could do. It was a matter of time, but the life of the enormous dog came to an end. So, she could only silently lament, as both shared time with its owner and was the most loyal friend. As they say, a man's best friend is a dog, though in this case, it's a woman. Growling. But as if hearing Tsubaki's pleas, the dog moved its front paw, staining it in blood. Slowly turning its paw, it used the blood as ink to write a message, catching the attention of both Yuno and Tsubaki. Remember. A simple message that made Tsubaki's body tremble. For a year, this message had been delivered by the dog every day. Tsubaki always wondered who wrote these messages and made her pet deliver them. Now, the mystery was unraveled. Remember. Initially, she gave little importance to it, but as time passed, Tsubaki largely ignored these messages. Now, with her friend on the brink of death, something within her mind broke, and thousands of images flashed through her mind. Tsubaki clutched her head in pain. Yuki-kun. With all those memories flooding her mind, Tsubaki couldn't help but murmur this name. She looked into the dog's familiar black eyes, tears streaming down her face. The dog upon hearing this name, closed its eyes peacefully. Its mission was complete. Creek K. And with that, the purpose of this world was also fulfilled. The fragment shattered like a mirror, and the game came to an end. Chapter 299, You're an Elite. Two figures materialized in the time castle, two children, one aged five and the other twelve. Blood flowed through their bodies as the green-clad child was pierced by a katana, while the child with a strange aura and a snake blinked, like a damaged videotape. S-H-I-I-I-I-I-I. Simultaneously, a sound was heard, Rajak's diary had changed. You're incredible, Quinto. I must say you pushed me to the limit. Smiling, Yuki clone praised him, in this game, he was on the verge of losing. Rajak's intelligence surprised him. From the moment he entered the time fragment, his life and Tsubaki's were in danger. His powers, abilities, strength, memories. Everything had disappeared. Fortunately for Yuki, being a time clone, possessing the power of time, and not being a resident of the world, his memories remained intact. This allowed him to maintain sanity and not be confused like Tsubaki. But this also had its drawbacks. As a non-resident of the world, Yuki did not exist in this timeline. Fifth had recreated a fragment of the world's past, from two years ago, long before Yuki entered the world, even before Yuno was invited to the chat room. Because of this, Yuki was forced to take the form of an animal, a dog to be exact, as a human couldn't interfere with the past. He couldn't be human, he literally didn't exist. In this form, his actions were very limited. However, even so, Tsubaki could interfere in this fragment. Moreover, he could feel that this fragment was under Rajak's total control, so he had to be cautious and sought Tsubaki. Fortunately, it wasn't difficult to find her, she lived in the Omekata temple. Unfortunately, Tsubaki couldn't remember anything. While Yuki watched, Tsubaki proved to be an ordinary girl. This disappointed Yuki, he thought that working together, they could find Rajak. He was wrong. But when he was about to leave and search for Rajak himself, Yuki remembered something. In this timeline, Tsubaki's parents were still alive, so her tragic fate had not yet occurred. She had not been violated. Yuki was aware of Tsubaki's suffering and her story. Raziel provided him with the information he needed. Seeing Tsubaki happy with her parents, Yuki sighed. Let me help you a bit. With these thoughts, Yuki decided to give her a letter. Fragment or not, Yuki wanted Tsubaki to have a happy life, at least as a form of consolation. It might all be a lie, but a sweet lie is much more enjoyable than a harsh truth. Although in the end, she would have to face reality, she could enjoy this illusion. Fortunately, Tsubaki believed him and changed her tragic fate. Seeing the happy family embraced, Yuki disappeared. Time is limited. And so, a year passed. Yuki explored the entire time fragment but couldn't find Rajak. This was impossible. 
Yuki explored and searched everywhere but couldn't find a single clue about Rajik's whereabouts. However, he didn't give up. This fragment was under Rajik's control, so he decided to change things. Using the butterfly effect as an attack, Yuki changed the futures of many people. Those who should die were saved, those who should break up got married, etc. With many factors, the future changed completely. By doing so, Rajik's control over this fragment decreased. He could no longer interfere as he did at the beginning. These were good news. However, Rajik didn't sit idly by, he started to attack. But Yuki was very elusive, so his attacks didn't result in his death. He also wondered, after so many butterfly effects. Where is Rajik hiding why can't he find him shaking his head, Yuki decided to watch over Tsubaki again, as he was being attacked. Tsubaki might also be, so he observed how this girl was doing. She was happy, but she suffered from bad luck. But this bad luck was the beginning of everything. Yuki could see it, Rajik's influence was concentrated on Tsubaki. So a terrifying thought crossed Yuki's mind. He had discovered Rajik's hiding place. What a troublesome kid. Rajik was hiding in Tsubaki's memory, as they say, the most crowded place is the best hiding place. This is why he could never find him, it was right under his nose all the time. Yuki went back to the beginning, he could see it. Rajik wanted to murder Tsubaki, so her memory would never be found, and he would win the game. Yuki couldn't allow this to happen, he had to protect Tsubaki while making her remember. And so, a year passed. Every day, he made sure to write a message, hoping this girl would remember. He also applied the butterfly effect to influence the letter with the power of time, trying to make her remember. At first, it proved effective, Tsubaki had headaches every time she read it. But this wasn't enough. So, he got to work, he had to eliminate all of Rajik's influence around her. He started changing the futures of people close to Tsubaki, gradually cornering Rajik and succeeded. The areas where Tsubaki had accidents were decreasing, especially at school. That place was a safe zone, Rajik's will couldn't penetrate the butterfly effect. But this wasn't enough, as he was starting to do the same thing as Rajik. His will grew slowly, thus controlling the people in the fragment. Tsubaki was surrounded by a wall of Yuki's will. At this rate, Tsubaki would remember, and Rajik would have to come out of hiding. However, Rajik didn't wait for his demise, as his control decreased, he found another way. And that's by using Third's time fragment, the serial killer. He ordered him to kill Tsubaki but also cautioned him to be careful. Yuki's will is powerful, one wrong step, and Third would be trapped in an army of Yuki's minions. So, he tried to kill Tsubaki using accidental accidents, making sure the dog didn't discover his identity. This also marked the beginning of Tsubaki's fatal accidents. Fortunately, Yuki saved her from them, and this went on for some time, nearly a year to be exact, the showdown between a dog and a serial killer. But everything has an end, and Third's patience ran out. So, he decided to use a frontal move, preventing Tsubaki from going home and waiting for all the dog's minions to leave before killing her. This was Yuki's mistake, as he didn't expect a teacher to be an assassin sent by Rajik. He should have known that almost all the inhabitants of this fragment had their destinies changed by him. Also, the school was an absolute fortress. However, it was also an opportunity, an opportunity to end what was left of Rajik's will. So, Yuki confronted him directly. Unfortunately, Yuki was fatally injured, marking victory for Rajik. But when all seemed lost, Yuno's time fragment saved the day by killing the serial killer. That was it, the rest was in Tsubaki's hands. Whether she could remember or not depended on her. Yuki Kun. Fortunately, Tsubaki remembered, they had won. So, once Rajik was expelled from Tsubaki's memory, Yuki didn't hesitate to pierce him with his katana. It was a long battle. But we won. Yes. You won. You know, I had fun. Ani Ai Chan, you guys are amusing. So, win. Ani Ai Chan, you must win. You defeated me. You're an elite, Ani Ai Chan. Win this survival game. I will. Smiling at Yuki's response, a huge black spiral formed, swallowing Rajik and leaving only his diary, 
where a drawing of him being stabbed appeared, along with the dead end sign. Creek K. At the same time, the time castle vanished, returning everything to normal. It's all over. Chapter 300, Butterfly. Releasing his katana, Yuki clone fell to the ground, closing his eyes. His transformation had deactivated, his energy depleted. The time castle had drained much of his energy, and he had suffered injuries in the confrontation with Rajak. Ah, this is the end. For me. As a clone, Yuki was aware that he would soon disappear, his energy sustaining the state had run out. Yuki-kun. Huh. Opening his eyes, Yuki clone looked towards Tsubaki. She was staring at him with a furrowed brow, clenching her fists. The time castle had crumbled, so Tsubaki escaping from that fragment wasn't surprising if she were to look at it now. Miss Tsubaki. Why Yuki-kun? Why? With her body trembling and tears welling up in the corners of her eyes, Tsubaki asked with determination. She couldn't understand it. They had a deal where Yuki would protect her from all danger until the survival game ended, and so far, Yuki had kept his word. However, that didn't mean Yuki had to bear the burden of her life with her. Others might not know, but Tsubaki was aware. Yuki clone was finished, he had withstood the time castle on his own, preventing Tsubaki's energy from being stolen, as well as preserving her vitality. Moreover, he gave her the chance to dream. It was a beautiful dream her parents alive, living a life of love and affection. She never thought she would come to love that Omekata sect. For her, that sect deserved to disappear, it took everything from her. Her parents, her virginity, her future. But in that fragment, she was happy. That sect wasn't her nightmare, it was her home. She loved that sect. It was a sweet illusion, a sweet lie. But she lived all of this because of Yuki. He bore the burden of her hatred and allowed her to live. She was very grateful, those two years were the happiest of her life. If possible, Tsubaki didn't want to wake up. She wanted to keep living that sweet dream, with the sect, with her parents, with her beautiful and cute dog. But. Why why did Yuki go to such extremes for a happiness she would never have tn, cause we do a little trolling. It made no sense at all, it was cruel and yet very tender. That future, which she would have had if her parents hadn't died. Why I also wonder about that. Smiling bitterly, Yuki honestly didn't know why he did it. He should have let everything follow its course of time, yet he couldn't do it. Tsubaki's story reminded him of that companion he had in his past life, the woman who loved him madly and died for him. That woman, like Yono, depended a lot on him. She also had a fate similar to his, and he sincerely didn't want Tsubaki to experience that life of pain again. The guilt he felt towards that woman was a shadow in his heart. Maybe it's my selfishness or my regrets, but I didn't want you to suffer. I didn't want you to shed tears of pain. I wanted you to smile, I wanted you to be happy. Opening her eyes in shock, Tsubaki's body trembled, and tears began to fall. Yuki-kun. My time is up. Feeling his body getting heavier, the shadow beneath him expanded and began to engulf him. Yuki-kun. Wait. You can't go. You can't leave me. With his last breath and Tsubaki's cries, Yuki clone decided to end this illusion. I know it's not my place to say it, but live and be happy. Don't let the future you never had bind you to a world of dreams. Walk forward, you are a butterfly that has emerged from the cocoon, spread your wings and fly. For the love of your parents, for your past, for yourself, for your future. Yuki-kun. Trying to stop Yuki, who was being swallowed by darkness, Tsubaki held his hand. However, that hand disintegrated into shadow particles. This was normal, as unlike other clones, this Yuki had depleted all his energy, he is the past, he doesn't exist in this future. Goodbye. Miss Tsubaki, I enjoyed playing with you. Remembering his time as a dog and the games they had, Yuki smiled happily. However, before he left, a small decorative ball appeared in his hand. This was his last gift, so he disappeared into the shadows. Seeing it, Tsubaki trembled violently. This ball is the memory of her mother, that ball that accompanied her in moments of darkness. That ball was the light that prevented her from falling into darkness, 
her only spiritual support. Why? However, when she needed it most, this ball disappeared. Why do you appear now? Grabbing the ball, Sabeki cried and screamed. She had needed this ball a long time ago, but now. Turning her gaze, Yuki's body had disappeared, leaving a blood-stained katana, the one that killed Rajak. I don't need you anymore. Dropping the decorative ball, Sabeki picked up the katana from the ground. She no longer needed those memories, she has others now, and if possible, that will be her past. One where she is happy, and this katana is proof that she lived that life. Yuki-kun, thank you. I will cherish these memories. Murmuring softly, Sabeki kissed the hilt of the katana and looked into the distance, where energy fluctuations were being emitted. However, there are still enemies. Yes, Yuno was still fighting against Minin. She couldn't be passive anymore and wait for someone to save her. These two years she experienced taught her something important. She must fight, otherwise, the important people in her life will die, just like her parents, just like her beloved pet. So, releasing the power within her, she firmly grasped the katana, and her body began to float. I'm coming, Gaze-san. With a shockwave, her body shot towards the battlefield. Leaving the ball on the ground, the ball she never saw again, the ball representing her tragic past, she had discarded it and firmly grasped the katana representing her new memories. And just as Yuki said, the butterfly opened its wings and flew towards its future. Dash. You have lost, fifth, at the same time in the other time castle, the original Yuki had also cornered his opponent. The mirrors around him shattered, and shadows held Rajak tightly. Unlike Yuki clone, the original Yuki didn't have to find Rajak but put together all the pieces of the puzzle from a time fragment. The difficulty he experienced was much greater than what Sabeki and his clone went through, as he entered many mirrors. But unlike his clone, Yuki had Zakiel, Raziel, and Est by his side, making collecting the fragments easy. With overwhelming force, Rajak couldn't resist. This situation arose where Yuki bound Rajak while holding a small fragment in his hand. I must say I am surprised. Even I didn't think you would go to these extremes. The mystery of the two Reese Yukes also unraveled. Initially, Yuki had many doubts about the origin of the Rajak who fought against Sabeki and his clone, but now everything was clear. Summoning your alternate self, this is a remarkable feat. This was the reason both Reese Yukes had the same energy and power. Unlike a time clone, his alternate self turned out to be more powerful than the one in this world. Doing this was very risky, as sometimes a person's alternate self tended to be a powerless regular, not to mention how dangerous it was to summon it. Their mere existence in this world was similar to provoking a paradox that could destroy the continuous space and time. But here's the wonderful part, the crown protecting the world does not allow internal or external energies to harm it. As well as anomalies, it is a shield that denies any ability or attack that would destroy the world. That's why in this absolute shield, paradoxes cannot be created. Likewise, the creation of other parallel worlds, timelines, or reality changes on a global scale cannot occur. For the world, this is what's called an absolute shield. Apart from chaos energy, nothing can harm it. But this also works in favor of the participants, as many of their destructive abilities related to time and space can be used. Such as time loops, small-scale timelines, summoning alternate selves, etc. etc. as long as these anomalies do not destroy the world.